Uh, so I will call the meeting of the select board uh, to order at 6.35 p.m. on March 19th. Um, we'll start with opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. Is there anything on the agenda that we need to adjust or any announcements anyone needs to make as we get started? If not, we'll, we'll, we'll begin with public comment. Just as a quick reminder, if there are here pe people here for public comment, uh, it would be related to things not on our agenda. If you want to speak to something on the agenda, we'll just wait until that time, and then we'll have you speak at that point. Um, we generally, you know, don't react to those things that are in public comment. We generally have you keep your remarks to about three minutes. Um, we do do we do listen to those and take note of them. Is there anyone here for public comment? Please step to the microphone and s tell us who you are and the reason you're here. Uh, I can speak from here. Uh, well, except the microphone doesn't pick you up for the television, so we do they need can, you to come can up. They pick me up. I'm sure. Um, I have a very good voice. Um, no, they can't. Actually, no. They can't. We need you to come forward. Please come forward. Everybody else does. And just identify yourself on the microphone and, and, and speak to the, to the issue that you have. Yeah, it's difficult for me, so that's why. Um, and I don't want to be on camera either. Uh, so. Well, the, the camera's actually in both directions, so you're on camera either way, so. Okay. I'll bring you the microphone. Yeah, that might be easier. Yeah. That's fine. A little bit more handicap accessible. It's okay. I'll accommodate you. There it goes. Here we go. That's right. Thank you. Um, so my name is Jennifer, and there's about, about five items. <laughs> so I'll just have to speak very quickly. I hope you can catch up. One is I would like to have, uh, thank you for putting, uh, fixing the elevator in town hall and getting it up to um, have it inspected. Uh, uh, similar thing in town hall also too is the ladies room. I can only speak for the ladies room. The, the stalls is very dark <laughs> and the sinks are very far um, from, um, from the edge of the sink to the wall to actually the, the faucet is kind of far and women have, um, it's known biologically that we have shorter arms, so it's very difficult. Um, so you're in the dark to go to the bathroom and then to wash your hands, you have to have very long arms. <laughs> uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, next thing is, I would like, speaking of bathrooms, I would like there to be a ban on all so-called air fresheners in all public bathrooms. It is a health hazard um, because it is, uh, causes mood disturbances, headaches, uh, nausea, a variety of things, vaginal irritation, because <laughs> um, it lands on the toilet paper, etc. It's not necessary, doesn't work, not ne necessary at all. Um, what cleans the bathroom is flushing the toilet, and it usually works. And it's usually fans or and or, and or a window anyways to let in fresh air. So I like those um, air fresheners, so-called air fresheners or artificial fragrances to be banned from all public bathrooms within the town of Amherst. Next item is that I would like to see, uh, May is um, Jewish Heritage Month, and I would like to see something along those lines. I would like to see a flag on the town common. I would like to see uh, taught in schools, and this is to address the ongoing saga of anti-Semitism, especially it's currently in Amherst, um, that people have been well aware of. And then the next one would be, um, I'm trying to find out about the presidential apartments, how to get that um, enforced. It has not been enforced. Lottery winners have not been, uh, only two out of the six lottery winners, so-called lottery winners, it doesn't feel like you're winning when you're losing, um, have, have only been given an apartment that was promised to them. It's been six months. No one has received the apartment that was promised to them. Um, moving expenses were not paid for. Um, and to how to get that address. I'm trying to get it on the agenda on the CBA, and there's been no such luck. No one wants to address it at all. So I want to know how that could be further addressed, or what kind of recourse can lottery winners have in order to address this issue? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming out and, and sharing those things with us. Um, we do take note of them, and, and we will. Uh, potentially take action on some of those things and, and certainly ask about them at potentially a future time. So thank you. Is there anyone else here for public comment other than items on the agenda? Items on the agenda we'll do at the time. Seeing none, I'll move into our agenda. Uh, 
First item on our agenda for action and discussion is the short-term bond anticipation notes. Mr. Bachman, do you want to yeah. bring Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to welcome and announce that Sherry Boucher is here, and she is the acting treasurer uh, since today is uh, the first day of our um, without uh, Claire McGinnis, who has, as you know, resigned. So Sherry's here, and, so, and she has stepped up to become the acting treasurer, and, and along uh, with Jen LaFountain, who will be the acting tax uh, collector. So I really appreciate the, the things that they've done to take on this. So thank you, Sherry, for that. So you want to come up? And, That's what I was say. Yeah. It's folks at home. Make sure they put yeah. a name to the face. Right. You can have a seat. Have a seat. Hmm. <laughs> this is our first time. <laughs> You're on the spot. Yeah, exactly. well, but Sherry's done this multiple times. She's uh, seen the transition uh, through Treasurer's uh, three times, I believe. So she's an old hand at doing this. So pull, the pull the mic for, to you. So we're asking the select board to sign a short-term note in the amount of one million one hundred ninety-five thousand for the following purchases: uh, thirty-five thousand for the dispatch communication equipment authorized on the May 2015. This is the final year of the debt for this purchase. One hundred and twenty thousand for repair and improvements to the Amelie Street parking lot, including the crosswalk and accessibility ramp on the north side of Amelie Street. As approved in 2015, debt services funded through transportation enterprise fund. This is a three-year of a five-year payment schedule. 500,000 for the sewer project in Amherst Woods, as approved in 2016. Although the authorization was for three million, this amount is a rollover of the amount borrowed last May. To meet the project spending needs through the end of the fis this fiscal year, another amount will be borrowed in May. 540000 is for the land acquisition between Montague and Sunderland Roads, as authorized in 2017. This is the second year of a five-year plan. The note will be dated April 5, 2018, and will, ma will mature on April 4, 2019. The town received an interest rate of 1.62% via competitive bid. Six bidders responded to our request. Um, <clears throat> Sherry has the notes for you to sign. There's no action that's required. No action vote. is required. Just need your signature. Okay. <laughs> just signatures. Right. So is she just going to leave that with us and we'll sign later, or does she actually have to take it with her now? Um, if I could leave them with you, or yeah. do you need me to stay? We can get a, well, yes, I'll do it. We'll sign it after the end of the meeting then. But you should be give it to, give it to, give it actually, to Andy. Give it to him. He's our clerk officially. Yeah. Awesome. I need th at least three signatures there, here, and then on each one of these sheets here, here. Yeah. So then. each of us should be signing five times. Sorry. Five times. Yes. Okay. 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 You, you can take it. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need to stay? Do I need to stay? Uh, no, you're all set. Okay. Right. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you very much. Anything else to add to that? No. Okay. Appreciate that. <coughs> Thank you for uh, stepping into that interim role for us as, as uh, acting treasurer. So we'll, uh, we'll do our signature duty a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, we'll take care of that. So next up is the MSBA Statement of Interest for Fort River School and Wildwood School. I will start by saying that I am an employee of the schools and therefore I will recuse myself from this and I will yield my chairmanship to Ms. Brewer, who's acting chair for this month, because we rotate that. So she's the vice chair. And so if you would be so kind as to sort of run this section of the meeting, I will disappear for a moment and <laughs> let you guys discuss this a little bit. Thank you. It is not 100% clear that it was required for Mr. Slaughter to do that, but he thought in the interest of everyone understanding everything, it would just be simpler if he did that. We haven't done these statements of interest for a few years. In fact, he was thinking that maybe we hadn't done it until since just before he came on the board three years ago. And so we have done these as a select board, however, for 
quite a few years in a row before we finally got in line for the last project. So these are very lengthy documents, which anyone can look at in our online packet. There's one for Fort River. There's one for Wildwood Elementary School. This is simply the process we have to follow. It's not a matter of convincing the select board that these things need to be done, because we know they need to be done. But we also know that we, we have a guest with us tonight that we'll hear from shortly, because he is also someone that more people need to see. Um, but in the meantime, the speech that I used to always give associated with these is that when you make these statements of interest, things say things like, Building jeopardizing student health, poor health and learning environment. This does not mean it is not safe to send your children to our schools. It is safe to send our ch your children to our schools, but we know that they need work. And so it's always a little nerve wracking to, to, to see this put into words in the way that it is. But um, we do believe, or we would not ask you to send your children to our schools if we didn't feel that way. So with that, um, if Mr. McPherson would like to introduce himself to everybody who hasn't met him yet, and then could, could give us just, the again, the brief overview, because we don't need to be convinced. We just know we need to sign this. I did prepare these statements of interest from the preceding applications that were done recently. This is probably a 75% overlap. Uh, you're exactly right. The schools are entirely safe to occupy, attend, and so forth. But they are in four throughout. Uh, and I've said this before, I'm not telling you that you don't know already. Uh, the groups in the four divisions, the teams, uh, the institutional systems are not functioning properly. We just have a multitude of things that need to be done improve them and, and increase their long-term viability. So what we're seeking tonight is a vote on the statement of interest. We do have language that is very, very specific associated with each statement of interest application. Uh, apparently that needs to be read into the record. And we need to proceed forward and repair our schools so that we can have it for all of them. Would someone like to go ahead and start with reading one of these and then see if we have any questions before we, so we can break up our narration tonight? Because <laughs> it is a long, an long item on the motion sheet. I mean, and, I, and my question is go related right to the two, and sure. I can ask it first or I can read. Absolutely. <clears throat> ask you can ask the question. So um, having read these over, you know, when, prior to the meeting, um, I don't know if I remember the last time we did these, but. I, we very well may have since my tenure on the board, but um, there's two requests here. There's two elementary schools that we're talking about. We don't know at this point um, which or both might be in play, and so I'm just trying to understand a little bit of the submission process. At this early stage, we just kind of put them both in, and at a later time, there'll be some decision making about um, what we actually end up with. My understanding is the state doesn't, uh, you, you end up with one, not two, and I guess I'm interested in somewhat managing expectations if people see that there's two submissions. That does not mean they're going to be two new elementary schools in tandem, and I just wanted to get clear for myself on the process. We are not seeking new elementary schools. Okay. We are seeking repair and or possible addition to either or <coughs> the submission of one application for Fort River as an example does not necessarily impact the application for Wildwood. So okay. it is in fact possible that we would receive two sources of funding or two partitions of funding. How that exactly unfolds in the future is entirely. Okay. So so it's essentially rena re work on those two buildings and they could potentially both happen if they receive the fund yeah if they receive we have prioritized Fort River over Wildwood although they're essentially equivalent in condition for condition um, and we chose Fort River as the priority because of the immediacy of the need for repairing of the roofs the uh, ventilation systems and so forth okay that's very helpful thank you and Whenever I, I'm happy to read. Sure. And, unless there's read more first of that discussion. Let's see if there are additional questions. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, 
I move to authorize the, <clears throat> the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated March 14th, 2018 for the Fort River Elementary School located at 70 Southeast Street, Amherst, Mass, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. <clears throat> and they are. Priority one, building jeopardizing student health, poor health and learning environment. Priority five, modernization of school facility systems, poor energy efficiency and poor operating efficiency. Priority seven, obsolete building, poor educational space utilization, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment <coughs> from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the town of Amherst, Amherst Pelham Regional School Districts, to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. <coughs> I have a question for the town manager. I will admit I didn't pull the documentation from when we did this several, several years ago, but this is not the language exactly in that it doesn't start with the resolved language that was recommended to us in the required form of vote. So I'm concerned because if I look at the front page and I look at the back page, it says having convened an open meeting on such and such date, um, our motion doesn't say any of that. Our motion is more just our standard motion kind of stuff. The rest of it, I think, is adequate, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the appropriate beginning phrase. And I know sometimes these technical things are pretty fussy about what they actually want us to say. Mm -hmm. If you could, that would be helpful. It's just the very beginning. Yep. It's different. So how would we change? Yeah, if it's um, like the first sentence, maybe. Did we have a second? All right, so let me just. Um, <clears throat> good eye, uh, Spur. Um, do I, do I, should I read the word resolved as well? Uh, just, just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Say resolved. Resolved. <laughs> uh, having um, convened in an open meeting on March 19th, 2018, prior to the SOI submission closing date, the select board of Amherst, Massachusetts, in accordance with its charter bylaws and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority. The rest follows, but I, I'm happy to read it again. Authority, the statement of interest form <clears throat> dated March 19th, 2018, for the Fort River Elementary School located at 70 Southeast Street, Amherst, Mass. 01002, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building in the future. Priority one, building jeopardizing student health poor health and learning environment. Priority five, modernization of school facility systems, poor energy efficiency and poor operating efficiency. Priority seven, obsolete building, poor educational space utilization. And hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the city the, or commits the town of Amherst and the regional regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Okay. Thank you. It's now, were there any additional questions? editing on the fly there. Yes. They did give us the language. It you just didn't get translated to our motion sheet. Well, I'm going to need a different one. So we appreciate the school's help in, in making that happen. And thank you, Mr. McPherson, in providing that to us, because we did have it. It just didn't okay. quite get cut and paste in the right place. Questions 
about the statement. Should we make her read it a third time just to see how it goes? <laughs> All right. So in that I'm case, the next one so, <laughs> <can have it. laughs> so you'll have to give them the wording for the first oh, sentence for the next one. Know if it's, do you have a separate one for the next no, one? No, these are these priorities. Are they different? Words it's there? just the first sentence. The All, right. All right. All right. So, call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? And so that is four zero unanimous with one absent. Okay, and now if someone would be willing to take the first sentence from Ms. Kruger's desk and tack it on to the first sentence that was provided on our motion sheet, I think we'll be okay. You just uh, the dates have to be adjusted as well. Well, just, just the there's a part about authorize, if you can just pick the sentence up. Uh, so, with resolved. Having uh, convened an open meeting on March 19, 2018, prior to the SOI submission closing date, the Select Board of Amherst, Massachusetts, in accordance with its charter bylaws and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest form dated March 19, 2018 for the Wildwood Elementary School located at 71 Strong Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Priority one, building jeopardizing student health, poor health and learning environment. Priority five, modernization of school facility systems, poor energy efficiency and poor operating efficiency. Priority seven, obsolete building, poor educational space utilization and poor, um, and hereby uh, further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the town of Amherst, Amherst Regional um, School District, at Amherst Pelham Regional School District, to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Were there any further questions? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Balcom, do okay. have this? So we have another 401 absent, and it's my understanding, Mr. McPherson can probably help us with this, uh, according to the documentation we have in front of us, that actually not Mr. Steinberg is our clerk, but our town clerk is going to have to certify that we did this. And so if you'll get her the language, then she'll be able to write that letter, and it'll go to the schools, and then everybody mm -hmm. will be happy. And everybody will get their material in time to get it in before the deadline. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. work yeah it seemed fine but I'm not sure it wasn't wasn't picking up the the audio very well so are we ready for me to take the next yes, topic yes we are Please. okay thank you very much for that appreciate that so next on our agenda is uh, complete streets policy first look um, so mr. Mooring and mr. Hayden yeah would like to come forward and other members of the committee are here as well absolutely yeah I'm just gonna make the presumption okay so just tell us who you are tell us who you brought with you since I think you brought us some uh, some colleagues from the TAC and so, so if you wanna... yeah. well thank you very much for um, inviting us in tonight 
I'm Aaron Hayden. I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. And tonight, uh, this is the first time that we have something ready to advise you all with. Um, wish there could be more of us here tonight, but we have uh, family duties and everything else that, that will delay uh, two of our members at least for another 15 or 20 minutes. But uh, Bruce Carlson and Mark Rubinsky are here with me tonight. Um, Bruce is uh, a member of the Complete Street Subcommittee that did the work to put the policy together and bring it to um, the, the, the Transportation Advisory Committee as a whole. Um, missing um, are Eve Vogel. We are seven all together. And um, Rafik Rabib, Sandra Anderson, uh, I think these are people that are familiar to you, and Kimberly Tremblay. Um, the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, is still labeled as new on the town website, I noticed. <laughs> um, indeed, we feel very new. And part of our work is to figure out how to uh, uh, interface with town governance, with, with you, uh, on the various matters that affect transportation. To that end, we are developing ways of doing things, our policies, our practices. And uh, Complete Streets is an example of how we might be moving forward in the future. Um, it's a little different than other things. The uh, Complete Street Streets policy is a state program that um, promises money, which is, makes it interesting to us because we're, we're always interested in how we're going to fund these wonderful projects we're going to be advising you on. The challenge for the subcommittee in pulling together this draft was taking the, um, the state guidelines, the state requirements, their idea of what a complete street is, and make it appropriate for Amherst. Amherst is unique in many ways, as we all know and, and, and appreciate. And, um, our sense of completeness of streets and how they connect and where they connect to will be different than the standard policy. So the, the, or, the or the generic, I, I, not even standard, it's more like a generic state policy. The, um, the subcommittee, which by the way, um, included Tom Webb, we, we are happy to uh, have help on our subcommittees from outside because there's a lot of, a lot of work that, that has to be done. The, uh, the subcommittee's job was to understand the state guidelines and then interpret that into Amherst. Uh, the places where that most affected the policy that you're, that you're reading now is uh, in exemptions and requirements and, uh, and metrics, what we are going to measure and how we're going to measure them. Um, the, the subcommittee worked for several months on this policy and in the end brought it to the, the uh, advisory committee as a whole. And we did some work on it, some tweaks. Um, in fact, we sent it back and, and had it redrafted by one of our members, which was very helpful. And we held I guess it's our version of a public hearing. It's not a public hearing in that it's not a requirement, but we did invite uh, the public to come in and comment on, on our policy uh, in an open meeting to which they were expressly invited to speak. And in the end, we folded that all together in the, in the draft that, that you see there. We also engaged as much as we could committees that we thought might be interested in this policy. Uh, the planning board even invited us to come and speak with them, and, and we did that. But other committees, you know, had things to say, had, had suggestions, and, and, and we intend to reach out that way for any one of our policies that we'll be developing in the future. Uh, I hope you have the result of the planning board's vote there in front of you. It was... Um, um, almost unanimous. There was one abstention. 
but otherwise there were, I guess there are nine, so there were eight, there were eight yeses and one abstention. Um, I'm going to stop there and invite questions. Um, the reason that I invited my colleagues to come along is I'm hoping that they'll help me field these things as we get into the arcanus of, of, of this. All right. Do we have questions? Ms. Kruger. Um, <clears throat> I, I had made a few, few notes. Um, it, it's, and I want to uh, commend the Transportation Advisory Committee for getting something you know, to getting getting this far along, because I know you've been really working on this um, for a while in a very determined manner. Um, it, one thing is, it it looks like um, exceptions from the complete street policy um, ultimately are the decision of the select board. If I'm reading, I'm reading from page the top of page three. It says exceptions shall be reviewed by the transportation advisory committee, which will forward its recommendations to the select board with supporting documentation. Any exceptions must be approved by the select board with document. Is that so? Am I understanding that any, if there's a reason that somebody can't follow this policy, which is somewhat of a mandate in some ways, then that would that would come ultimately to to this board? Yes. Um, maybe two reasons for that. One is that's the way it's done. I mean, it, your, yeah, I'm yours is the, clear. is the final authority on this. Uh, but also, many of the exceptions do involve other requirements that might be for that same space, most of which are also in your jurisdiction, and certainly, if not directly, uh, one step removed. Mm -hmm. So, yes, okay. we advise. Okay, so I just wanted us to realize that, that was, that's in here. Um, so just go in order. This is from the, you know, the minute to some of some larger things. So under five network, the second sentence, this network will offer robust transportation routes. I don't know what a robust route is. Uh, we spend a lot of time with that. And the... Um, you have another member joining. Hello, Eve. This is Eve Vogel, who is chair of the subcommittee, and she's welcome to join us here, or me here, um, or them there. Um, we spent a lot of time with the idea of robust, how best to describe the, the importance, uh, the value of maintaining the connections, uh, the various different connections that happen along a complete street that, that are expected. Um, we can change that word if you'd like, <laughs> just but, but the, the idea is it, it's, it's, it is a descriptive word and, and not precise, but then that's the point of exceptions. Okay, we're not, this is under the network section. Yes. question on the exceptions? No. Uh, about, about the use of the word robust in the, um, yeah. robust in, uh, um, in, in our network. So. I just um, I had a question mark. So let me just Jur under six jurisdiction. It looks like on town uh, in town ways town um, controlled projects um, projects will adhere to the town's complete street policy. And then things that are not within the town's jurisdiction, like a private development or something on one of the campuses, it says the town shall advocate that the project comply with the complete streets policy and interconnect with the existing multimodal transportation network. So who, who would advocate and how would you advocate? I mean, I get requiring, but where you can't require, what is, uh, what, you know, is that compel the select board to advocate or how do you see that happening, that advocating when it's not in the jurisdiction of? You want to speak to that, or um... I don't know that we talked through those kinds of details. That in many ways, the uh, I would say the the first sentence is the more important one. That where we have jurisdiction because we're providing funding or any kind of permit, that we would require it to comply with the complete streets policy. Um, the second sentence, I think, it goes along with what comes. I believe, where is it? Um, is it before or after where we say the town will work to network? Oh, it's the very next paragraph. Um, the town will build and maintain partnerships with all these other folks 
So I think the idea is that we have ongoing partnerships with other folks that are doing developments of various kinds and um, and that in the process of making that. So I guess I'm, I don't know if we exactly, we, we're not naming who, but the oversight of the entire complete streets policy, we say um, at the very end, is the select board and the town manager in concert with the transportation advisory committee, other appropriate town departments and committees. Right, so I, I'm just, I guess I'm trying to be clear what the expectations are of this board or the town in general, because you know, in two years or something happened, well, you didn't advocate or, you know, in concert with, I would, you know, that was another one, like, I'm not, I'm not totally clear, but I'll just, just moving on. Well, I just, just, to, to, to be fair, we may not know exactly part of our, our uh, developing our practices and policies would involve that. The idea is that even outside of places that we have direct jurisdiction, uh, that do have direct impact on things that we do, like the driveway is going to connect with mm -hmm. our road, that we accept the responsibility of doing what we can to make sure that it complies with our the, this policy. W what that it is uh, remains to be seen, maybe. All right. And I'm also unclear what the we is, what the royal we is in this case. But l let's move on, because this is first look. OK. Yeah. So. Um, just seven design where you um, talk about some of the design <coughs> features in a, in a general way. And then it says references include but are not limited to the following. And then you have a whole list of um, different guidelines and things. And I was, two things. One, I was just curious because I would, I would usually see this as a uh, references at the end because they, they often change a lot. And, um, I see that they're in, embedded in here, so that's just something I noticed. And then, I don't know if these are two separate things or redundant, but it says, uh, the first bullet, the last, the fourth arrow, it says Amherst Street Tree Map, and then the last bullet is Amherst Tree Inventory. Are those two different things about trees, or are they the same thing? Is there an answer to that? Um, I think that they are, um, I think one is embedded in the other. Uh, I believe that the the tree map is in the inventory or the other way around. Right, so you may I'm not even sure. Condense them. The, the uh, and we may want to condense those. What was important in that is is that again in creating a, a a taking a generic policy which you could apply anywhere and making it Amherst um, trees are an important part of. Of Amherst, that wasn't so. the question. It just, but we'll, I wondered we'll if follow it was together. a redundancy yeah. or not. I, I'm all. looking at the earlier draft because I actually didn't get the, the most recent copy myself, and I think both of those were added um, based most very recently based on the comments of the Shade Tree Committee, and so I'm, I mean, they I just, just need to get you know just as a for, you know reader, and it's, it's our first look on our agenda. So yeah. I, I was like, I know we have those kinds of things, but are those both the same or different? Um, I think I will. I think that's essentially it, except that, similar to my other comment, oversight responsibility. The select board and town manager in concert with the transportation and other appropriate towns. So that's great. That's a general statement, but I'm not really sure what that is obligating us to or, you know, so I just have a question mark there. Um, that's what I got. Could I first ask what the last point was that Ms. Kruger made, because I wasn't sure what page she was on. When oh, she the very, uh, page six, there's oversight responsibilities. Yeah, that, the that needs a lot of work, I agree. All right, so. well, <laughs> good. you take a shot, because I've definitely yes. used enough of your yes. time. Yes, and so, um, if I could, yes. this, this is unusual, as Mr. Hayden knows, from when he was on the select board, that we have very few written policies in general, in town. I mean, we have staff has plenty of technical policies they have to follow based on their technical expertise. But in terms of town policies that come out of the select board, um, which this eventually will be, um, they're few and far between and they don't have a standard format and so we're just kind of winging it as we go. And things like, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea to put all the references at the end because some of them will change and that's easier than fixing it in the middle of the document. We could certainly do that and thinking about which tree is embedded in which tree plan to make sure we do cover them both because we have, we have those specific documents. But the other part of it, too, being associated with oversight responsibility, I have, I, I suspect that at the end of our questions, the town manager might, might offer us some insight as to how this might 
work, practically speaking. So for example, the select board is never going to oversee implementation of anything. That's not our role. And it's certainly not the Transportation Advisory Committee's role, but it is town staff's role. And so figuring out ways that we can say, we want to have, it's the select board and Transportation Advisory Committee want to have input as to reporting requirements and progress reports and what those things might include so that we don't say later, well, that's not the report we were looking for, um, so that we can give that information ahead of time, but to make it clear where the lines of authority are. And that also does reflect back to what Ms. Kruger initially brought up about um, you know, who, who shall advocate. You know, the shall gets tricky in terms of then, who, who would we necessarily look to, would we say, to the town manager, this is a shall, and the meaning we all agree is that the town manager shall look to this and then see about assigning it out, or the shall is some other body. So we appreciate that you struggle <laughs> with finding exactly the right wording to both accomplish what you want to accomplish but not be too overly prescriptive. So thank you for that. So we'll just have to work some of those details out. When we do um, come with the next version of this, we'll want to make sure we include the Transportation Advisory Committee's names at the given time and the subcommittees <coughs> with any additional members because we want to give people credit for their work and we also want to know who to call um, later when we're confused about what something actually means. So that would, that would be super helpful. So I think that um, I'm also just interested in, you know, what is what you feel the Transportation Advisory Committee as an ongoing committee's role can effectively be in this, what you see the select board's role as, and what you see more as, say for example, Department of Public Works, whenever a project comes up, goes through this policy, matches it to their work, and then eventually reports out on it. So getting, getting a sense of that would be helpful. Um, in, in this policy or in our overall policy, um, and, and I'm, not, I'm not being facetious, I, I'm sorry if it sounded that way, but the, the um, part, of, part of what we're realizing is that the five networks that we'll be advising you on um, are all interwoven with each other, obviously, and certainly within this complete streets. So as we work through those uh, prioritizations for the other networks and their maintenance and their improvement, those priorities clearly will reflect back into any request or any, any chance that we have at a complete street um, implementation. Um, so that's, that's, that would be the knot that I would want to untangle. And it'd be very simple for us to put in something simple here saying you, you shall you know, talk to this group or that group. Uh, or maybe we would rather, maybe I would rather it reflected back to an understanding for the networks as a whole. And having said that, I don't know quite how we would do that. I, I, I'll just say that I, I'm appreciating the, the questions um, that you're asking about sort of how does this actually work in terms of the oversight and the coordination. And I would say that the, 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 the basic, you know, we, we developed this, you know, the DPW staff did the first draft and then several of us on the subcommittee um, and, you know, took that draft and worked with the mass DOT guidance to revise it, but we didn't have the kind of expertise that you're actually bringing, <laughs> bringing right now, you know, to even ask these kinds of precise questions. And so um, it's, it, anyway, the insight that you guys would have about how to make that work would be much appreciated. Mr. Wall. I don't know if it's because I'm exceptionally tired or exceptionally benevolent tonight that I didn't have a lot of specific <laughs> questions like that. I mean, I guess I was sort of assuming, given that you were taking charge of this in a sense and that some of these things are under our purview as part of the public way, that a scenario might be you come to us and report on something. For example, UMass is putting a new entrance and we would like that to articulate with our bike lanes and everything else and you'd bring it to us and we'd say, well, what should we do about that? Should the town manager talk to the whatever, you know, or the, that the conversation would take place and whether it's nailed down, I'm not so concerned about. I don't know if that's what you had in mind by way of consultative processes or I mean, I would say actually, honestly, a lot of the process now is that the DPW is sort of the initial, right. you know, and the, and the DPW <coughs> makes a lot of decisions about whether to bring things to us mm -hmm. at this point. Um, Yes, so, and we, we understand that that's changing. Um, 
uh, very rapidly. I mean, there'll be other sources of, of, of work for us. Um, maybe, maybe the short answer is yes. I mean, that, that is kind of the amorphous, an extension of the processes that we have now that we would now, that the TAC would be involved with. Um, and uh, certainly I'm anxious to get whatever definition we can, whatever better definition we can have for these processes. Um, right now, the ideas are driven by our recollection of dealing with these things mm -hmm. in the past and our wishes for what they might be in the future. Follow this. I did have one specific, Ms. Kruger raised the question of the exceptions. Again, maybe my, my brain is not functioning. But you know, the first one is uh, the transportation network is undergoing routine maintenance, you know, potholes, geometry stays the same, they're fixing something. That struck me as qualitatively different from the other ones, which involve, say, new construction projects that accomplish the same purpose, or a project where public transit isn't required. Am I reading that correctly? And then does that mean that if a pothole temporarily closes the bike lane, you have to come to us for authorization? So, um, I'll, I'll, well, let me just say one thing about these exceptions in general. So these exceptions basically come word from word, the word state. for word from the Mass DOT guidance. And in the Mass DOT <coughs> guidance, they basically say, if you include any other exceptions besides these, we're going to look at that really carefully uh -huh. as a potential excuse not to do what you're supposed to be doing. So we basically use the language that they suggested and, and plonked, it, plonked it right in here. Um, that said, um, you know, I think um, my, well, I guess my interpretation of this is that um, if there's going to be an exception that's questionable, then it would have to be reviewed by us and justified. But if it's just very apparently one of these exceptions, then it would not have to be, you know, a, a major issue. Okay, because they talk about forwarding recommendations to select board, and that's why I wasn't to follow Ms. Kruger. <coughs> if you look at the top of page yeah. three, <coughs> Mr. So Moring, did, you, to be involved. did you want to contribute to this piece of this conversation as well? Please okay. come forward and <laughs> provide a bit of clarity if you would. I'm that would be great. And just help us out here. <laughs> <coughs> he's got his camouflage on, so he's hiding in the back. You don't have to completely give up all the chairs. But. Yeah. You guys are doing great. <laughs> um, you're asking a lot of good questions, and these questions were all asked by the committee. And as we grappled with these questions, as the committee grappled with it, it went back to this first thing that Mr. Hayden said. This is a state program we're trying to fit into, and we're trying to make a policy that makes the best grade possible. And it actually grades really high if you take their criteria. There is a lot of unknowns of how it will actually operate, and we know that, and we're, it's just kind of that way. Uh, the exceptions are meant to be that the ones listed there are general exceptions. If we're doing pothole repair, if we're doing maintenance on a road, if we're going to overlay a road, those don't get complete streets. But if we actually do something more defined in a roadway, then we'd have to do the complete streets policy, follow all those steps. And then if we couldn't make it, then we'd have to bring forward the exact sort of like Pine Street. We couldn't do bicycle lanes on both sides or sidewalks on both sides we would bring that forward in the design and these would be the design recommended and these are the exceptions we're doing so yes it <clears throat> would go through the process of the committee seeing it and then the select board finalizing and accepting the plan like sort of like what pine street was done so that's how the exceptions i see will go the same way they kind of go now um, with the exception of the first one which is maintenance and then the, we don't really, didn't really understand the next ones really, because um, we're really not that big that we have projects that go on simultaneously. So a lot of those would be, are just there because they're stated in the state policy that these should be exceptions. exceptions. So that's kind of how we put it together. Um, so if you have any other questions, I'm happy to help. And I hope I cleared that up a little bit, or I might so, have made it muddier. So I'm just gonna follow up on that just a, for a second. If, however, we, we had the capacity and will to do complete streets, even though we were just doing a, one of the things that would fall under an allowable exception, we can still, we're allowed to do that. We are. Right. So it's, it's really, if we are, this affords us an opportunity to sort of, um, when doing more 
routine or small sorts of things, which is what that first bullet really is about. The others are, like you say, in sort of communities that don't match with what we do generally. But like in that first one, it's like if we're just kind of keeping the street functional, we're doing a small repair, we're not compelled to comply to the complete streets. If we were doing a much more much more extensive uh, reconstruction than we are comp compelled to to fit into that as best we can, obviously. Correct. And a good example is Bay Road right now. We have a section about 200 feet that blew apart. Uh, we're going to go in and overlay that and repair that up as best we can, but it's not going to be a complete street. It's just maintenance and repairing what's there. So I'm still a little confused about the exception section then. So not muddier, just less clear. So um, just the way my brain works is saying exceptions shall be reviewed, you know, the second part first. If you're going to have exceptions, exceptions have to be reviewed, then have to be approved by the select board. And the way this reads, which I totally appreciate, it's what the state wrote, but in terms of practically speaking, the way this reads now, pothole repair is going to have to go to the <coughs> Transportation Advisory Committee and going to have to go to the select board. That's what these words say. That was my question, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you don't really want that to be true. <laughs> we, we actually, in the state, doesn't read it that way. That's what those words say. Sorry, the state doesn't read it that way, but that's what those words say, and I can't approve a policy that says those words if that's not what we're doing. So, so we're going to have to find a way to put something slightly modifying in there so to, some, to both satisfy the state's application process. But right. so something like exceptions other than um, routine maintenance from the complete streets policy would require something like that. Right. Something like that, right. for example, because we've talked about how one is different the first bullet point is substantially it, different, and I it I find it hard to believe that the state does think you're going to have all those people review it. So they, sh we all know the state is not great writers. Okay, just sorry, they aren't. <laughs> and so while we appreciate you got to fit the boxes so that they get it, so that they give you the money, and we want the money, um, finding a way to work in that phrase that Ms. Vogel just yes, used. I yeah, I believe most of the people who did this are engineers too. So. <laughs> Right. The the others seem to be inherently prove it, you're proving a reason for exception, whereas the first one seems to be less that way. You know, like cost of accommodation is excessive, disproportionate to need probably you gotta defend that. You've got to sort of make an argument for that, make a case for that. And to do that for any sort of routine maintenance, which is essentially in the bullet one, it's a little overkill, to be perfectly honest. We if you like, we'll just move bullet one down into the as Ms. Vogel said, we'll move it into that paragraph. And then you only have a format yes. thing could probably address it. Yeah. Right. Other questions, Mr. Steinberg? Um, yeah, I don't want to um, get into this in great depth. Um, Mr. Hayden at the beginning mentioned having consulted with other relevant boards and committees, at least giving them the opportunity to respond and. Um, the one that I was particularly interested to assure has been consulted as the Disability Access Advisory Committee. And um, in saying that, uh, I, know to, I know that the uh, users and modes section two of core commitments make several references to paratransit riders, uh, disabled residents, assistive mobility device users. Um, but uh, I was also curious whether there's been any discussion about uh, people with either um, significant sight or hearing impairments. The, um, so the details of the, the design of the road, of the complete street, of the elements that would be in the complete street, which in this case includes sidewalks, um, and, and for, for, for people who are mobility impaired, probably most importantly sidewalks, but also bus stops and crossings. Um, we, in the other guidelines that we're putting together, um, do include and, and very carefully include accommodations. Um, the, the, the challenge that has been presented to us by the DAAC has been to go above and beyond what is required. Certainly to follow the, 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 um, the um, Access Barriers Board requirements and the ADA requirements, 
that can go be taken for granted we're going to be doing that we're being challenged to go beyond that and well we're going to work on that so um, I guess to answer the question while that is not here in this policy it is part of the policy for every element that this is uh, involved with thank you other questions? Yes, Ms. Brewer. So along those lines, I would hope that the next version of this policy would state in some sort of perhaps ending section, not quite sure again, because it's not like we have a template, um, that wet, that revisions to this policy will, because you know we'll vote on it someday and it'll be that vote and then the state will change something or you'll realize something else and we'll want to change it, but that there should be some indication that revisions would need to go before whatever that year's equivalent of a DAC shade tree is one you mentioned. I don't know if there are any others, but to specifically call them out. And it doesn't mean that you will that you will necessarily adopt everything that they've asked for, as you've talked about, but that way everyone knows we didn't forget to talk to them and that they had the opportunity to have input. And I think that's something that we just incorporate in a phrase near the end that revisions to this policy should be made available or you know, before acceptance or revote or we'll make up something because that's what we do um, that that indicates that it'll go just like you made the rounds this time that it would make the rounds if, if something changed because despite all the expertise all of you bring to the TAC it may well be that there's something that seems easy to you and isn't in fact easy to members of, a member of the DAAC who would notice it differently and we just want to make sure we're including them because they have historically not felt included in many things so that might be one way of addressing that without mentioning that they wanted this thing but we're giving them that thing for now until we get to the other part yeah I would I would revise and extend that remark to include other committees that are appropriate, mm -hmm. uh, public shade tree, conservation, planning, uh, zoning board of appeals, the design review board. I mean, they're, they're, we understand that our advice really does need to be colored by lots of different places. We're likely not to think of them all the first time around, um, or maybe even the second, but we're going to try. Thank you. There further questions if not so, so the next step is you guys will take the comments back from the select board work on it again and then come back with a revised um, proposal to, to the select board right there, I guess I'm wondering whether there's someone we should or we could conference with about some of these specific questions about process volunteers <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I would point out that, that uh, Ms. Kruger has made it to most of our meetings and has been very helpful in these things. Um, really, I would, I would maybe ask that of you. How would you like to do it? We're happy to go, you know, go into our little locked room and, and come up with these revisions. Okay, it's a public meeting, so it's not exactly locked. And, uh, but on our own, uh, with Connie's oversight, um, or uh, and come back with proposed revisions or maybe even just the revisions so that you can see it in, you know, focus in on them directly or throw the whole thing out with things in color or some other process. Ms. Kruger. Um, well, I, I have enjoyed being the liaison to the Transportation Advisory Committee and I, I do try to get to the meetings. Um, but I'm thinking, first of all, I'm, I'm one of the five members plus Mr. Bogleman, I don't always know. I mean, I have some ideas. I don't always know the exact guidance. So I might look to maybe the chair or a chair and a member meeting with maybe me and Mr. Bogleman and another select board member, whether it's Mr. Slatter or Ms. Brewer or whoever, just so we just sort of um, do that kind of thinking, maybe, maybe redrafting and then we, you know, try it out because it's an awful lot of one responsibility for me to say, yeah, you got the process right because I, I know some of it, but it's a hard question. And then secondly, I, you know, I, I sometimes have schedule conflicts like the last time you met and I think the next one coming up. So if we had something specifically scheduled for that, it would get attention and wouldn't be cutting into your regular meeting and I, I would know that I could be there if, 
you know, if I was one of the ones. So I, I'm, I'm thinking a little more broadly than just me showing up at your meeting. Maybe we can just take the time to make the revisions, give you a marked up copy. That at your leisure, you can give feedback back to the town manager and he can feed back is probably a better way so we don't have to bring everyone into the committee and yeah, no, that's select board time to talk about it. I think that's, that's the next step is for you guys to work a little bit on it. You've heard some feedback and we sort of work it back and forth through our offices. That makes sense to me that it would, that I believe, what I believe I just heard Mr. Morning say was that it would go, they'll mark up a copy, it'll go back to Mr. Bachelman, he'll distribute it to the select board, but it won't yet be on an agenda. And it'll be Mr. Bachelman saying to the select board members, tell me, is this what you wanted or did you want this other thing? And if so, write it yourself and then right. send it to <laughs> me. And, and other than that, then my other question was, I did allude to earlier the idea of you having input on this. I don't know how much input you've had a chance to have so far. But while I don't mean to put you on the spot here, if you didn't have something in particular you wanted to talk about, one of the things I will want you to tell us more about is how you see that overseeing piece mm -hmm. so that it's, it's clear where the lines of authority are. Mm -hmm. So the only, only other question I have in, is, is relative to, um, are we operating under a timeline to get this in place to make us, you know, available for funding, for grant funding. I know that having that helps. I just didn't know, are we, are we trying sure. to meet a certain deadline or target date to? Uh, no. Okay. In this situation, this, we've already submitted our intent to make the policy, so that checks off the box for MassDOT, so that we don't have to have an official policy for MassDOT yet. Okay. And actually, the way things are working out, we won't really be eligible for a project submittal until October. So we still have one more step to do in between, and then this is not the step, it's something else we have to do. Okay, great, that's good to know as well. All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate thank you coming you. out thank tonight you. and helping yeah. us out with thank this. Great showing thank from you. the TAC. Thank you all for coming <laughs> yeah. in. Wow. Appreciate the work as well. Uh, members. So next on our agenda is uh, personal procedures manual revision. Mr. Steinberg, did you wanna make a statement here? Yes, because uh, my wife is an employee of the library in a um, non-union position, um, I uh, am going to <coughs> recuse myself from participating either in discussion or voting on the next two items on the agenda. Great. Thank you very much. So we have uh, a moment. So let's um, we'll have Ms. Radway. Do you want to come up? and? And Mr. Butterfield? Why don't we just move them all up? Yeah, you can all, <laughs> you're, you're all welcome to come Archer forward. Another, the personnel board shows up in force. Yeah, oh. exactly. Bring them all up. So in order of events, we have the uh, actual changes to the manual, but then <laughs> secondarily, we have an actual actionable <laughs> item that we're going to take action on. But, but let's start with the big one first, if that's all right, <laughs> since that's the order in which we're taking things, the, the changes to the manual. So if you'd be so kind. Yes, I'm Tony Butterfield. I'm currently the chair of the Amherst uh, Town Personnel Board, and I'm happy that some of my colleagues, in fact, most of my colleagues are with me tonight, Chris Hoffman and Catherine Porter and Charlie Sherpa. Uh, only Rebecca Woodland is not here. And on their behalf, and more importantly, on behalf of the staff committee that has really done uh, all of the heavy lifting, we are happy to present to you the new improved personnel procedures manual, but I also want to acknowledge the members of the staff committee who are here, and I think there are two of you, Joan Mizziak and Linda Wentworth, and the others, and I want to get their name into the record because they worked very hard on this. Stephanie Ciccarello, the sustainability coordinator, Teresa Florent from Payroll and Benefits, Nate Malloy, Senior Planner, Jen LaFontaine, the Collector's Office, and now our Acting Collector, and Mike Olkin, who was the GIS uh, coordinator who has since left the town's uh, employee uh, employment. Just by way of background, this project has been in the works for a long time, maybe as long as three years ago. The members of the personnel board individually did some minor edits on the then in existence personnel procedures manual and it was clear that process was going nowhere. 
So a little under two years ago, HR Director Deb Bradway said, we need to get serious about this. And I think the best way to do it is to put together a staff committee representing the different departments. And we will meet regularly and we will do a complete and thorough overview and updating of the manual. And so that's what she did and that's what they did. This committee has been meeting every week since August of 2016. Remember, that's 2016, <laughs> not 2017. <laughs> And during that time period, they have also met with the personnel board on nine separate occasions to keep us informed as to where they were, ask questions, make sure they were on the right track. Then late last fall, the, the draft document was posted, I guess, on the uh, intranet website that the town has so the employees who were going to be affected by this could see it. And a survey was sent out asking for their uh, feedback and any questions or concerns they might have. And then in December, this past December, the board met with all of those uh, uh, non-unionized employees face to face to have some interaction about what was in there and if they had any concerns and it was mostly a listening session for us. So. What you have before you is the result of that process and all of that uh, hard work. I, we hope that, we think that in general this document uh, is way more user friendly and welcoming to, uh, to new town employees. We are pretty sure it's very up to date with all the rules and regulations and in particular Massachusetts law and federal law. Uh, we've put more or less in an appendix, uh, copies of all of the uh, policies of the town that affect the behavior of employees, even a few that don't really come under the purview of the personnel board. There are some new sections. Uh, there is the one uh, clearly economic item regarding a proposal to increase the shift uh, differential. And throughout, we have tried to emphasize more than has been in the past, and the town manager has been very supportive of this, and that is the whole idea of professional development for the town employees. Indeed, the very process of creating this staff committee to do this work is an example of that professional development. And they also did a whole lot better job than we, as members of the personnel board, could have done uh, ourselves. So with that, I think I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Just before we start the questions, Ms. Redway, did you have anything you wanted to offer or add to this? Before we... Okay, all right. She's my security blanket for <laughs> any questions. Yes, oh, that's what she'll do. She'll answer all the questions. Okay, all right, there you have it. So are there questions from members of the board? Ms. Brewer. So there's a lot in here. And so thank you very much um, for all the work, of course. But in addition to when we know we don't tell you that often enough. So thank mm -hmm. you for all the work. And then also, especially for getting it to us ahead of time so that we had a little extra time to look at it because we did have a rare week off. And so uh, some of us were able to put a little more time into reading it ahead of time. And also for providing the memo because knowing you know, what are the highlights of what we're looking at. It turns out there's a whole lot of highlights because you changed a lot of stuff. Um, so we didn't have to look far to find changes. So thank you for bringing us all up to date on this. One of the things that I had asked Mr. Bockelman in terms of the rest of the select board not knowing because we can't deliberate outside of public meeting is I had asked him a couple of questions associated with sick leave buyback. And although we may each hold different opinions about how sick leave buyback works, uh, one of the things that I appreciated that Ms. Radway was able to explain to me quite clearly was the reminder, of course, that this is the non-union personnel that is, that is looking at here and trying to look at, you know, what are we doing in terms of the bargaining agreements, what have we historically done, and not having basically different classes, although she would not use this terminology, I would, not having different classes of employees in terms of how we treat them for you know basic human needs sorts of things. And so um, I appreciate your explanations that, that went a long way toward me understanding the history behind why we do what we do. And uh, again, I don't have to agree with all of it, but understanding why 
the different things apply to different issues and then of course other things are collective bargaining issues because it is always awkward for the select board because it always feels like it always feels like we're in collective bargaining although of course we're not always in collective bargaining and we are able to get updates in executive session with collective bargaining but it often feels like we can't really say anything ever about anything that's in a contract because somehow that might be problematic if we say something even though we don't do any of the negotiating but then that means that when people express concerns to us or we develop concerns on our own, there's not really a place for them to go. And so that kind of all came out in my questions uh, associated with that particular issue. So I just appreciate that there's a lot that you're trying to balance with all of this. So thank you. Other questions? Oh, some really more of a comment. Um, I mean, I think, um, I was I was um, glad we had the summary memo. I've um, been able to be at a number of the personnel committee meetings as the liaison um, because it's usually early in the morning. There's less things to conflict with, but uh, so I've gotten to go in. I just think over the two years, really, um, both the personnel committee or personnel board has really undertaken a, a huge task and the collaboration with the staff group was just a great model I mean I don't know how other towns do this but it seemed like um, not only were really good ideas brought forward by that collaboration and sort of testing you know the staff may have come up with something tested against the personnel boards questioning and probing and um, acceptance or not and then I think I mean, Tell me if I'm wrong, but at the end of the day, I think there was real buy-in from everybody that this was ready to go and a really good product. So um, it was a lot of work. Um, I've seen a lot of pieces. I certainly didn't read the one in my packet at this point, <clears throat> confess. Um, but I just, I just think it was a great process and a really fine product that um, the whole tone of the manual um, changed through this um, to be a welcoming um, kind of a document and more accessible document and of course legally bringing it up to today's time and it, it's hard to keep that stuff current but this had a lot of catch up to do so um, I just wanted to acknowledge what I think a really fine effort and I always felt good you know after one of those working sessions. Hey. <coughs> If I, if I could, thank you very much. Uh, the appendices are 50 pages and the document itself is 40 pages. And we, we really put the appendices at the end so they could be changed mm -hmm. uh, as policies are updated um, by the state or federal government without affecting the body of the document. No, I just want to echo what Connie Ms. Kruger said, is that this was a mammoth undertaking, and I've been in other places where they've attempted this, but it doesn't get finished, and mm -hmm. it, it takes a long time, and, and um, two years is a long time to work on something. I think you're right, the model of engaging uh, the employees, uh, and, and the personnel board is really good at listening. The personnel board comes in regularly and listens to employees. Um, interacted with uh, employees on a regular basis. I do think that um, Deb Bradway deserves a ton of credit for sort of quarterbacking this entire thing through the personnel board and through the employee committees. Um, it, there were a lot of, uh, this looks all nice and pretty now, but there were a lot of rough spots along the way that where people disagreed and had to work through things. And so I think that um, this really, I mean, it's sort of, our, our thing says draw. 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 <laughs> so I think it's, it's, I it's, more, it's more than a draft. <laughs> it's a little bit closer to being a draft. So, <laughs> so thank you. That is a really terrific piece of work. Ms. Brewer? They're actually, because, you know, you wouldn't want to go away <coughs> no. empty handed without an edit after all this work. So be, as an outsider reading this, and I did mention this in my email, pages 27 to 28 where it talks about sick leave buyback, it's already the policy that w less than 10 years, no buyback. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense to me to say that effective such and such date, the new policy is this. It's like, it's the same policy. 
And so somehow being clear that nothing has changed in terms of the 10, at the 10 years, that's still true. And um, because it doesn't say the new policy is less than 10 years no buyback, it says for new employees. And the reality is it's still no 10. So just in terms of people's ease of finding how they are compared to the other employees. Sure, the, in, in fact, the only thing that changes in the sick leave buyback for uh, new hires after July 1st, 2020, is the cap right. for retirement. The first bullet is not a change. And the first half of the second bullet as well. Thank you. Well, we know you got at least a page. 20. Well, I had to get I had to get one in there. <laughs> That's rough. <laughs> you have you have no idea how many fines I did in my electronic version, so to make things work out. But that was the one that I found frustrating. I do want to say to the other members of the select board that having uh, Ms. Kruger along with us was quite helpful. She was at most of the meeting. She did have a lot to say. And knowing, with all due respect, uh, Ms. Kruger, knowing that you were also the liaison to the Transportation Advisory Board, Connie, get a life. <laughs> this is her life. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> Although I will say, I had a harder time keeping my mouth shut in your meetings than in theirs. <laughs> I had a lot of chirpy things to add. You, oh. were very, you were very gracious about that, Mr. Butterfield. So are there any... Was there a specific edit that you wanted to suggest for that or or because we <laughs> we it. have the motion on our motion she says <laughs> presented gonna, slash amended so you over. could um, actually I, I have a note you have a note you can do that you'll make it make even more sense than it already does okay I'd so is there further comment or or suggestion for the for the personnel policy manual in um Mr. Slatter, I'd be happy to read that motion. Please, yep. if you would. I'm delighted to read this motion. Um, I move to adopt the personnel procedures manual revisions as amended. Is there a second? Yeah. All right, there's been a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so that's four to zero or unanimous with one absent. So thank you for that. Um, so next, a much more specific sort of topic relative to uh, non-union hourly staff shift differential increase. So if you'd like to introduce that for us. So consistent with the shift differential provided in the collective bargaining agreements with the DPW and with the SEIU, our proposal is to increase the shift differential for affected non-union personnel from 70 cents to 85 cents per hour. There are currently five employees affected by this. And based on the total number of hours they worked in calendar 2017, uh, this will cost $160. And would, when would, the, would this take effect immediately after? Our vote if we All right. any questions or comments for our guests relative to this if not then I would entertain the motion I don't, I don't mind doing it but I'm happy to have someone else do this one no, I'm uh, distracted feel free to do it you look this I guess I, I have it in I don't know unless mr. Wall wants to do this one. Oh, well, no, I would this one is not quite as exciting. there's a typo in there it should say 15 cents because 70 to 85 is 15 cents, not 10 cents, but on our motion sheet. Oh, I see it, I see it, yes. Yep. Some, oh my goodness, my goodness. Um, the motion sheet, it's just, it's not, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, I got it. Um, put the DRA. Yeah, the DRA. Yes, I move to approve an increase of 15 cents in the evening shift differential for non-union employees from 70 cents to 85 cents per hour. And there's a second. And that's yeah. the differential. That's not what we're paying people for no, 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 no. evening work. That's right. It's in addition to. 
So is there further comment? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Nope. Sorry, I'm giving you the eye because I don't want you to let him go yet because I actually <laughs> did want to so, ask a different question. So that's unanimous with one person that absent. Absolutely but anyway, go right unanimous ahead, with please. one absent. Thank you. I, I knew I had another note that I wanted to ask you about. So this, I'm sure this isn't a change. It's just a clarification for those of us who don't go to personnel board meetings. Um, Appendix A is the personnel bylaw itself. The bylaw itself has not changed. And the bylaw is part of our general bylaws? And so even though it says draft, because the whole thing says draft, nothing in it changed. And it's exactly as it's been in our general bylaws since uh, 95. OK, because you didn't, all the wonderful work you did didn't mean we had to change that. So we don't have to do mm -hmm. anything for town meeting is what I'm getting mm -hmm. at. That yeah, I didn't we, miss we covered something. that, yeah. Excellent. Good. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to your other members who've come this evening and helped us out. And walked us through this a little bit, so thank you very much for that. Enjoy your lives, which apparently I don't have one of, but. <laughs> so wh why don't we take a short recess Good for idea. five minutes or so, let everybody stand up, walk around, and yeah. stretch your legs a bit. Yeah, Mr. Steinberg back. Find Mr. Steinberg, yeah. All right, so we're all back. Thank you all. So next on our agenda is the annual town meeting draft warrant, a first look. Uh, do you want to just sort of take us through? Sure. Just hand out so a little piece of paper here. I just handed out this long sheet of paper to you. And um, these are in no, the order that we've placed them in, because you haven't looked at the warrant to number it, is how we think we can organize them in terms of when, you, they would, when the people would come in to talk to, about the warrant articles to you by your four meetings in April. Um, and so this is sort of a, the universe of uh, potential articles. Um, and I think we're pretty settled on on these. But a lot, half of them, pretty much, are are standard ones that um, that you would expect to see. Uh, there are four petition articles, um, so um, we can walk through. We had agenda setting, or uh, not agenda setting. We had warrant review this morning with town council and town moderator, the chair, uh, TMCC, and staff and uh, went through a, a draft warrant. Uh, there's a, a lot of work to be done on it. The town council has a few things that he has to work on. We have a few things that we have to work on. Um, and But the idea on this is that we would have a draft in advance of your meeting on Friday, which is, would be the time for you to discuss the warrant and the, article, the actual language of the articles on the warrant. You don't have to sign the warrant until April 2nd. So this is sort of your first look, and are there things that we're missing from your point of view, or are there things that you're like, oh, we're not ready for this, or anything like that? That's the idea here. Um, it's good to have something to look at. Um, there's a number of things that are, are um, scheduled for a meeting of the 18th of April, which is a meeting I won't be here for. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what flexibility there might be to swap some things around. What? We can adjust it however you I didn't hear what you said. Wasn't recognized. So I didn't <laughs> oh, say anything. that's why you slept. She oh. didn't say a word. <laughs> oh, um, it's a non-comment. I mean, I, comment. I, I mean, certainly not everyone can be at everything, and I, if it needs to be, then fine. But a couple of things I've worked on. And there's and some swap because the other, any of the other, the other three dates are fine, but that date, I'm, I think. So I, you're not available. The, the no, I'm out of the country. Right. On the 18th. Yeah. Right. And so I know that. Wait, I'm gonna read the. Sorry, the. So that's 18 that April 18. Just having struggling with that, it's not 2018, but that's just me. I know the 18 is on every line. <laughs> it's hard. The one it's date, month, here. year is the order in which we're doing things. Um, so the other thing I would point out is is that it's likely that with the uh, the petition articles, um, there's one zoning one if I'm correct on this, and the other three are petition articles. The one zoning one is closely aligned with what the planning board is bringing forward. Yeah. I'll just say that now. Yeah, um, so it, we might want to put those on the same night because then they can all mm -hmm. talk about it at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. And then I think, you know, as far as the other three, it may depend upon availability of petitioners and, you know, our yeah. own schedule as far as what mm -hmm. will or won't work as Brewer. So with, without knowing how much behind the scenes has already gone into this. Is it possible to ask the planning board to come a different time than April 18th? Sure. 
because if if if, it, if it isn't that that had to be the time because of their schedule of hearings and when they can get the reports done, et cetera, um, if they can be moved to either the you know the ninth or the twenty third, either because they'll be ready or because they won't be ready, in which case the twenty third, uh, I think it's essential that Ms. Kruger be here mm -hmm. just because of our work on the internal working group. We didn't invite anybody. We went to have the conversation. Uh, yeah. This was okay. done today. We went, okay, we this had, is we before. Had, oh, no, we had okay. we had we had the warrant review yeah. at, and that finished at noon. We put this right. Deborah right, Cook. Okay. Put this together, and then she said, "Should I invite people?" I said, "Let's talk to the select board tonight and see where." Yeah, and that's it was fine. useful. This is very helpful. Yeah, no, and, it, and okay. no one did anything wrong. I just like, no. oh my god, all the ones that I care about, right. are, I can't be there. Right, because that's that, the other thing about the 18th of April is a Wednesday. Is that correct? Right, just for those of us, because you're because it's the week the of Monday's the holiday. school vacation. Yes. Monday's the holiday. Right. Um, in the in the Boston Post came. Might be. Yes, we'll be handed out that evening yep. or that afternoon. Um, the sixteenth. The sixteenth, correct. Um, what was the other thing I was going to mention about this? Uh, so there's, I don't know if that made it in today's. We had a conversation. There's a number of easements relative to road work and that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to going to cluster those. I think those have been listed as a single line there, haven't yes, they? Yeah, they've already been clustered down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a number of those. I also just as a you know, uh, Ms. Kruger and Ms. Brewer may very well know this, but I'll advise my other two colleagues because I saw this today that the medical marijuana, um, I believe it's the uses one, is a really long article because it, because the state CCC, not our local CCC, but the state CCC identified and articulated different kinds of uses mm -hmm. or, rec uh, you know, sort of retail establishments and that sort of thing. So there are, rather extensive, mostly programmatic, I guess I'd say, you know, definitional sort of things that are being considered to be added to the warrant, I mean, not to the warrant, to the, to the zoning by law. Um, and so that one's a really lengthy one. Um, so it would be very helpful to have um, both of you here to, to kind of go through that, because that's a, I can probably guarantee that will be a very difficult one just because of the size of the, the, the changes that are being recommended. Spur. So one option associated with that as well is that there, although it wouldn't be traditional for the way Amherst does it, we already talked about a slight modification to the layout of that particular article because it's going to be extremely difficult to reprint accurately. We know we've run into problems with that in the past. Right. And so they're already talking about maybe combining some categories. You know, the definitions have to stay what they are, but right. then in terms of putting them just so it's fewer things for people to try and hop through in that fashion because it is... It, we looked at it and we all said, wow, this is, tell me isn't going to like the way this looks. Because it's, it, it's, it, it's, it just is what it is. It's it a is lot of letters. There's a lot of detail. Yeah. And, and there was some clustering. I don't know where it was before. Yeah, there was we gonna, they were going to try some clustering. Something. But it's, 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 it's going to be tough, I think. I mean, there's no way around it. I mean, it's necessary as well, though. But, but I think that hopefully in, in our conversations uh, before and at town meeting around that article, I think I hope that we can have uh, substantive conversations about what it's trying to cause to have happen. Um, so we're not tangled up on things like layouts and, right, right. you know, <laughs> odds is, and ends of that sort for word processing versus the actual meaning of the words. I'm actually not understanding, maybe Ms. Kruger will be immediately obvious to her, but I don't understand what the abbreviations mean for the second item under April 18th right now. What? <laughs> <laughs> Center text credit offsite. I don't know. <laughs> it's um. We know what the we we have a general sense of what the articles look like, but we sure don't know what that one means. <laughs> I don't know that one. I, I was wondering. Uh, there's a bunch of typos. Does that oh, there's a lot of typos. Yeah. Because this was the, we understand that it was put it was together quick. in a hurry if, after today's this, warrant review. I understand that. Line. It's supposed to be treatment center. Oh. And off-site dispensary, oh, okay. so it's treatment. So it's probably supposed to be TRT instead of TXT. So one of the things we'll want to do when we republish this is, even though it's mostly an internal document, to be super clear that that's not new. That's just a revision to what's current. That's not a brand new concept. We don't want people right. to right. start getting worried it's that these are brand new concepts. But and the warrant title of the item <clears throat> should also make that clear that some of these are almost housekeeping right and then some and of them are not that one in particular is a very and very small change rough but. park designation of 
Act D. Yeah, yeah. But there's, a, there's, you know, that's okay. We'll yeah. get these cleaned up. Yeah, yeah. No, if we're going to swap, swap dates, I yeah. would suggest giving some consideration to switching budget and zoning for between the 9th and the 18th for um, two reasons. One is because of the um, request made by Ms. Kruger, and the other is that um, while I don't anticipate that we're going to get any news that's going to cause us great problems out of the House Ways and Means Committee budget, we won't know what the House Ways and Means Committee budget is until probably the 11th of April. Right. Good point as well. If that had some, if there's some major shift, there may be some work to be done relative to that. If there's something we don't anticipate that, but yes, Ms. Brewer. The other thing we'll want to we'll want to make sure we're clear about, though, it's too bad Ms. Brestrup was here just a couple minutes ago and now isn't, but um, is that the second packet deadline is April 19th, and so we have to have the planning board reports before we, as by practice, before we do these articles ourselves. And so, obviously, they were planning to have it in the second packet, at least. But if they were scheduling, if, if we schedule it for the 18th, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is they may not be ready. They may for want the, the 23rd. So they might want the 23rd. And that would not be unreasonable given the volume of <laughs> reports they're going to have to write and still get them done. I mean, so that means they'll actually end up in the packet before they come to us, which is totally it's fine. fine. Right. As as it's have. totally fine if it goes in that order. But we don't want to push them to have it done on the night if they weren't. If they were going to do that, great. But I suspect not because they, they have a lot going on. It turns out isn't all about marijuana, surprisingly enough, despite the huge amount of time we spend on that issue. So I think um, anything jump out at anybody as far as things they're. I have two questions yes. since since you just are fresh from warrant review. You know exactly what all these things mean. And so the Ag Commission change and the Recycling Refuse Management change, I don't care what the changes are at this moment. I know we've talked at least about membership numbers. But what I'm asking about is are those things that are currently town bylaws or currently town meeting actions or currently mass general law acceptances? because it should be clear in the warrant what those are, and I don't know what they are, so I'd like right. to know that coming into it. So the AGCOM membership change is a little bit of two of those things, because we had town meeting take action, but there's also a governing section of Mass General Law as well, so those have to be in alignment with one another, and that's some of the, Out of some of the questions we have posed to council or will pose to council about how to word that properly. So that's the case. Um, okay, the recycling just to add on that. Yes, um, please. Uh, so what town council said that a lot of ag commissions were set up before the state law was exactly. established and then they came in after the fact and said, here's how you should do it. But uh, a lot of towns like Amherst had already set them up and that's why there's a conflict in, this, in the right. law. Exactly. Oh, we and just the, ignoring the law. Right. And the Municipal Modernization Act actually was one of, that was actually something that did happen, the Municipal Modernization Act. And so, in addition to the Mass General Law reference, so it's, it's also in that section of the law. And so, my question to Town Council is probably the same as your question to Town Council, which is that the Municipal Modernization Act said, oh, here's how you set up an AGCOM. You know, like we didn't already know that. We've done it for years ago. But it says three to five members. And the question is, can we say, thank you very much, but we want ours to be seven, if we want it to be seven? Right. Or do we have to do it for it to count as an AGCOM and well, have the powers of an AGCOM? Right. The other thing we sometimes do is, is ask for like home rule petition type legislation. So right. that may be part and parcel of what, so that's the series of questions I think we're gonna to pose to council about this is, so they're still if we have an exception it. that, like yeah. one of the okay. things that's explicit in the law is residency of, of members. And mm -hmm. we were looking to potentially allow, say students at, uh, you know, in, in agriculture, ah. might not live in town, but are interested in agriculture. Is that an allowable exception or right. not? You know, so we've got to kind of wade through some of those things. On the recycling refuse management, um, you know, committee change. Um, again, I think that was an that committee is a committee of town meeting, isn't it? Is it not? Mm -hmm. It is. A, so, and again, I think the same. There's some of our own work because we were talking about sustainability committee, mm -hmm. and so whether we get our that piece done of 
our own work to potentially form that, but also to, to have the Recycling Refuse Management Committee discuss this topic as well. I'm not sure they've met to discuss that. So. They, they, I've, they have discussed it. I've talked with the chairman, um, and they're supportive of, he says they are supportive of this. They have a meeting on March 29th, I think, because I told them that you would want their support to, because basically this, it would, this would, the sustainability committee would subsume the, um, uh, the RRMC and they were in, in favor of that process, um, so. Yes. So again, just so that the warrant articles that we eventually get out of town council are clear in terms of Mass General Law and Municipal Modernization Act is nice because you cite the numbers and it's all very straightforward. But other things are creation of town meeting, also meaning they change the general bylaw or sometimes they're just a creation of town meeting with no effect on the general bylaw. And so that's where we sometimes have the disconnect because some, a few committees are in the general bylaws. Right. They were, a bunch of committees never went any place other than the select board. I mean, it's just, there's just so many different ways of mm -hmm. doing things. Right. And just because town meeting acted on it doesn't mean it ended up in the bylaw. Right. But if it's in the bylaw, then obviously it's a bylaw change as opposed to town right. meeting acted on this 15 years ago and now we're changing what town meeting would do. We'll try to articulate those specifics. Thank you. That makes it much clearer. Speaking of that, <clears throat> speaking of that, that reminds me of something Council brought up this morning in the Municipal Modernization Act. It had to do with the reauthorization of um, revolving, revolving funds. funds. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and there is a so that sort of standard reauthorization <laughs> is going to be a little different this time around, um, because it won't be just that. It'll, that'll be a part of a broader uh, standing authorization. So the Municipal Modernization Act uh, <coughs> actually compels us, if I understood the council this morning, to have those types of revolving fund authorizations be, in, you know, sort of set up, and then we don't have to renew them each year after that. But they are listed, and then we can obviously modify them if we need to. But but at the same time, um, what we do in this for the schools is there's a you set an upper limit on the on the revolving fund essentially and we've traditionally had to reauthorize it every year the change in state law around modernization requires us to sort of set that up in perpetuity essentially mm -hmm. um, so that revolving fund reauthorization is a little more than just that mm -hmm. it's it's that plus sort of complying with how state law now reads around around those kinds of funds i think Ms. mcginnis brought that up to town meeting that that was in Right. process and we weren't happening. compelled i think we had a sort of one year optional piece which right. is what we did right. but now i think we're kind of he required to, to switch it, right. mm -hmm. the format of that so that's that's that one as far as a, a preview on that are there any other questions i mean we'll get into the nitty-gritty a bit more on friday when we meet um and hopefully some of these that are a little raw at this point will be smoothed a bit so it's a, sort of like rough cut lumber versus uh, finished lumber so we'll we'll try to resolve those at all um so yes so the i'm gonna i'll bring this up again then but i if i just keep saying it over and over maybe it's more likely to happen um when we work out the schedule because planning board is able to do what they're able to do and whatever swap happens happens potentially the 18th and 23rd being switched one of the things we need to be super clear about because right. it's 18th and 9th no the planning board is not going to be able to do the 9th i'll say 18th and 23rd switch yeah. that's right. Thank right. You. likely likely i mean we don't know for sure mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean the 9th and the 23rd <laughs> I'm like, right. i don't care you, I don't all three of them if you, want, right? <laughs> you rotate them however you want spin the dial um is one of the things we've tried to get better about over the years, and I know Ms. Peppel has every intention of doing it, I just want to make sure we give her enough time to do it, which is that with the petition articles, people need to be told to give us something in writing, not just show up, because that is maddening. It does not have to be the same thing they're planning to put in the town meeting packet, but they need to, and since our first meeting's the second, and if we do do, I mean, our next meeting after this is the second, and right. so if we do, in fact, do those petition articles, that means that, you know, as soon as, you work out what night the planning board's coming, and I'm sure it's not the second, um, that they get told that like right. as soon as possible right. so that they can get working on that because they may not have planned for it. They may be thinking more about town meeting packets. Right. 
Right. Because some of these are not experienced petitioners. Correct. Any other comment or question at this point? Okay. Looks like a busy spring. It is, yes. I agree. <laughs> um, so, so I think we'll move on in our agenda, unless there's anything else someone wanted to add relative to that. And again, we'll, we'll meet on, on Friday morning, I believe, in, in more detail. Um, so next on our agenda, I have uh, committees, boards, and appointments and reappointments. We have two uh, appointments to make. Um, I will actually uh, speak very briefly to the appointment to the Agricultural Commission. Um, the person mentioned there, and I will not say his name, not because I don't want to, but because I don't want to say it incorrectly. <laughs> Mr. Mikowski, I think is how it said, Mikowski. I wouldn't want to, um, who is, is currently serving as the manager of the uh, summer farmer's market, which is the only one in town. Um, uh, has met with the committee actually as a whole because he was actually at their meeting and so um, we've moved his um, his uh, appointment into into tonight's agenda for that purpose he I think he'll he has a uh, nice connection to agriculture and a, and a little different view than just a farmer has by virtue of working with the farmers market and so um, I'm pleased to sort of have that person be added to our no motion. There's no motion. There's no motion. Yes, there is no motion. <laughs> yes, we have no bananas. <laughs> yes. We have no bananas. Okay, Sorry so we'll have, to, we'll no have to freelance that. But. There are no motions for could... either of them, Correct. Right? Okay. but that's okay Correct. because they were on the agenda. Right. Yeah. So yes. did anyone, uh, as far as CDBG, did Ms. Brewer, did you want to offer any comment or suggestion around our, our person there? just that we will be thrilled to fill all the slots on cdbg and we appreciate all the applicants that came forward and many of them were referred by other members or as potential members just going to show that that again is what makes the difference is that personal contact someone you know so i'm saying that to all the committee members out there who are planning to not continue after june find a replacement for yourself <laughs> because personal contact works in terms of uh, talking to other people. So that'll be great to have a full committee because they do still have some work to do even though those recommendations have been sent in. They have additional work um, during the rest of the year just more sporadically and so it'll be great to have a full committee and then it'll be ready when they're into the next Hopefully cycle. Hopefully I'll still be on board. They will all be still be there. <laughs> yes. All right, so if someone would be willing to potentially offer a Mr. motion Steinberg's or two. really good at making up motions. He's looking for a previous one where he's going to slot out different names and committees, I think. That's uh, exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> give him a minute. Keep, keep talking, everyone. Give him a minute. Uh, but if not, I'm going um, to. Go to the agenda for the names. You just get the agenda again. I uh, move to appoint Andrew, um, or let's start with David Michowski, to the Agricultural Commission for a term ending uh, June 30th, 2020. There's a second. Is there, yes. So we had this conversation briefly, and then I just <clears throat> was reminded by my colleague this is, makes it only a two-year term. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're in the mode of thinking of 2021 yet, as opposed to we did it for a reason, for two years versus three. Uh, does anybody remember? Well, often that's picked so to make to, with an awareness of oh, the staggering. Oh, absolutely. But I, but I, it, I haven't it, looked. It's not, I absolutely know for a fact that it's not true for Block Grant because others were ending in 2020. Oh, and so if we are looking for staggering, I think it? we all just kind of forgot that 2021 is three years from now now because, you know, it is. Well, it seems like a I long way away. I could just a comment on it. So given that we have not a rule but a practice of, two three-year terms and or six years, if, if it's two years and two years and, you know, it, it doesn't ultimately affect reappointing and filling out the potential for six years. So if it, if it was done deliberately, I don't know that it's bad to use these. I don't know. I wasn't, I don't right. know. 
I know it was an oversight for Black Grant because I just didn't think of 2021. That's, uh, we had a very brief conversation. We haven't made that motion yet, so we've still got an opportunity to see whether or not we want to so. alter the motion that we currently have uh, to make it 2021. I mean, I, I can look them up, but it'll but we could also leave AgCom 2020 since we might be changing AgCom. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, that, if you're sure on the other one, let's make that one 21. Right. And leave this 20 in a way that it doesn't. Right. It doesn't. We really can make it add up to six it. someday. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or not, as the case okay. may be. So we'll keep the motion we have on the floor currently at 2020. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that's unanimous. And so if you would be so kind, Mr. Steinberg, to craft the other. Um, just very simply, again, I move to appoint Andrew Grant Thomas to the Community Development Block Grant Committee through June 30, 2021. There's a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous as well. Great. Thank you both for your service in advance of actually serving. But we appreciate you stepping forward and offering your, your services to those, those two uh, committees. Um, next up, we have our consent calendar. Um, several items on there. Two things I'll point out real quickly for Cherry Hill Golf Course. There's seasonal licenses, both Common Vic and, and liquor license. And then a series of um, events, I believe, on campus are most of the rest of those. And if someone either has comment, suggestion, or would like to offer the consent calendar, or I'd take those motions. The one thing on the consent calendar that I was going to suggest is that uh, there was a little bit of inconsistency in wording because uh, the way it, the way it is worded is moved to approve the items listed, and then um, under some of them, two, three, uh, actually most of them, then there's moved to as opposed to just to approve, which was number one, I thought at least we should be consistent and it wouldn't make sense to include the words move to. Instead of to approve. Yeah, so I would just say to approve because um, it's all consumed, subsumed under one motion. And with that correction, I will move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for March 19, 2018 as amended. And there's a second. Yes. Okay, what did we decide last time about the patio? So, you'll note there's a photo yeah. and explanation. Mm -hmm. I believe. Well, I just want to make sure we we understand that we we are in fact taking that into account because right. mm -hmm. we said it was an issue. Right. Well, I think we wanted some some sense of where. There's an explanation, I believe, as well. And, and the chief a, has reviewed these mm -hmm. all. Right. I think there was a couple of emails yeah, relative to that. We we have we have his these do the in your packet they don't they don't have the, his signature but the ones we have upstairs do have mm -hmm. his signature. I don't know if they photoshopped the people into the photo because it almost they almost look like they were they did. sort of stuck in there after the fact no. it's not true but i know it's not but i'm just there's that slight look to it but anyway it's for i don't find their explanation particularly compelling and i think it's got a bit of an attitude in it that we've done it before it'll be fine don't worry about it which i do not find pleasing in comparison to when we have people coming before us for other types of licenses but if the chief feels okay about it, I'm willing to roll with it. But we will need to continue to ask that question if they have something mm -hmm. else that's outdoors. It's cool. Um, just having reviewed it again, I, I, I feel content with the way they've talked about how they would monitor the area and I just think it's always a little risky 
when we don't have somebody here before us, you know, texting is almost the worst, but email and trying to figure out tone, um, we really don't know. So I, I'm definitely willing to give the benefit of the doubt on that. But um, I think our questions created, um, you know, the diving a little deeper and thinking about it some more and, and whether those assurances could have been, you know, were already in place or we made them think about it more and they um, put put them in place. Um, I'm, I, I think it, it will be there's some thought put into managing the outdoor space and I'm, I'm uh, content with that. Right, and I think it also raises the, the question with the with the police chief a little bit as well, just to mm -hmm. sort of make him aware, oh, if mm -hmm. they say outside, I need to yeah, maybe yeah, ask a, about a question about how it's contained or that sort of thing. Absolutely. So I think we've hopefully moved in the right direction on that. Mm -hmm. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. All right, so that is all of section seven. And I believe at this point, we are into town manager report. Okay. Mr. Okay. Okay. Chair, a um, few things. Uh, yeah, thorough report last week. The, if you recall, you had authorized or approved a, the um, signs that would go up on Wednesday prior to uh, the annual election, and those signs are prepared. They're sort of the sort of wired signs that say "Vote Tuesday" uh, with the town seal on them, so they're uh, produced and ready to be installed. And we're working on locations uh, for those. Um, if you, uh, there is a weather forecast for additional snow coming up on Wednesday, Thursday. Just to update you, at this point in time, we are just over two hundred thousand dollars over our school or our snow snow budget. That's not too unusual. In FY15, we are two hundred fifty-one thousand dollars over. In FY16, we were thirty-eight thousand to the good. Uh, FY17, we were two hundred fifteen thousand, and this year we're two hundred two thousand dollars. So we're in the same range as of um, two of the last three years. It's still over budget. Typically, what we do is then at, you'll see at the end when we go to town meeting, we sort of move money around from areas where we have money in, to fill the snow budget uh, hole. Um, can I ask a quick question sure. about that? So in years past, we generally haven't had a circumstance like we've had this year with health insurance. Mm -hmm. So health insurance is likely to, you know, we have $100,000 in, in the reserve fund, mm -hmm. not to be confused with all the other kinds of reserve funds, yep. but the one the Finance Committee controls for these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So we're likely to have uh, that competing for those same dollars as the snow and ice. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So we're still working out the total volume of all that because we don't know what the health insurance hit is going to be at this point. Um, as you know, uh, with the resignation of uh, Ms. McGinnis as a treasurer collector, we have now three major positions that we will be searching and uh, we have schedules set up for all three for the town clerk, for the treasurer collector, and for the assistant to town uh, manager. Um, as, as I think we didn't meet last week, so I have appointed Jen LaFountain as the acting collector and Sherry Boucher as the acting treasurer. Um, they will be reporting to me, but also we've offered support from Mr. Burgess and, Ms., um, and Sonia and um, Dave Zomack and Deb Radway will provide a real network of support for them. They are both very experienced in their positions and will do a terrific job. There's some things they haven't done, but we're prepared to help them with that. Um, we're taking some things off their plate, such as we are, you know, um, we're transitioning to um, uh, the ambulance billing system being uh, to a private company, and so we will be managing that as well. Um, and just as that moves to a private company, the person who was doing that task. Um, the way you, you make that balance is that you eliminate that position, but that person has been relocated to the second floor here uh, to a position that was vacant. So um, no one's going to lose their job. We will be down one position, though. Um, I want to inform you that uh, um, I signed a um, pilot pr uh, agreement with Nexamp, which has a solar farm on um, 324 Montague Road. <coughs> 
and this is in, in alignment with how we've done other um, solar deals as well, according to David Burgess. Um, the I also signed a um, I haven't signed sent it to you, but I need to do that a, a um, host community agreement with GTI, which is the med, uh, medical marijuana provider on Meadow Street. Uh, and so that has been reviewed multiple times by town council. It's pretty much, according to Jeff Kravis, pretty much the standard that we're allowed to do as much as we're allowed to do from them at this point in time. Um, we have received uh, our audit report. It's a clean audit with no management letter, which is a big accomplish accomplishment. There are no items outstanding or that have been identified by the auditors. So very proud of our um, treasure collector and accounting teams for running such a great operation. Uh, we get audited every year, as you know, and typically they auditors want to find something, and um, they have found things, you know, small things in the past, like someone not documenting their hours for CDBG quite accurately the way they wanted them to be documented, and we fixed that. And but this year we had fixed all the things, and it was really terrific. So, um, so again. Congratulations to the auditing company. Auditing uh, for, <laughs> company. Yeah, yeah, thank you, auditing company. Uh, <laughs> the accounting department. Um, the uh, other thing with um, Ms. Mc, uh, McGinnis um, so submitting her resignation, I've appointed uh, Anthony Delaney to the, be on the Fort River Building Committee. And um, so he'll be full, full, he's been going to those meetings anyway, talked with the superintendent, felt like his expertise uh, was would be suitable for that. Also, the school department is is responsible for part of his salary this fiscal year, so it made sense if that's how the superintendent felt he, he wanted his resources um, to be used. That was good. Um, Mr. McPherson attends those meetings. Ms. McGinnis was attending those meetings. We had a lot of staff attending these meetings, and so. Um, but Mr. Delaney, it's also it, he'll be very good at that. He's already proven his worth there. Um, the um, uh, the Insurance Advisory Committee, I think I sent this to you on email, but not announced it to you in a, pu in a public meeting. The Insurance Advisory Committee um, approved the proposal for health insurance on a vote of nine in favor, um, zero against, uh, four, three abstentions and one absent. And this would to do three things. One it would be to um, move from a self-insured to a fully insured uh, health insurance product for the employees of the town of Pelham, town of Amherst, which includes the Amherst Elementary Schools and the Amherst Pelham Regional School District. Um, the second thing it would do is it, it would eliminate one of our two providers. Right now we have Harvard Health and Blue Cross. We would eliminate Harvard Health. It just is, makes sense to consolidate our risk pool with one provider. It gives us more leverage when we're talking to that provider because we can always move if we want to. Uh, the third thing it does is it makes plan design changes. Uh, this is probably the thing that's most uh, has most impact on our, our employees because it introduces a deductible, which we don't have now. It aligns our product with benchmark two, according to the GIC. Uh, there were there were basically three benchmarks the GIC has: benchmark one, benchmark two, and benchmark three. Um, and so we've aligned at this point in time with benchmark two which introduces the deductible at 300 for individual, 900 maximum for family. Um, has some other changes. There's some slight benefits to employees, um, but it's really an attempt to um, help uh, control our costs of insurance um, by helping employees be educated about the, where they make choices about where they seek coverage. Um, for instance, if you choose to go to a tier two hospital, which is the most expensive kind of hospital to go to, your copay is significantly higher than if you choose to go to a tier one hospital. The only tier one hospital, the only tier two hospital in Western Massachusetts is Bay State in Springfield. It's the only one out here. There, are people say, well, I like going to the Boston teaching hospitals. Many of those are tier one hospitals. It's not based on how expensive the service is. It's based on um, their output and their, their results. Are people readmitted? Are, are, are patients um, served well once, once they're in there? Are they, are they treated well? And all these different uh, metrics, uh, metrics that um, Blue Cross has. And so a lot of hospitals are striving to get into be tier one because people are making 
um, decisions with their feet about saying, well, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna pay that big copay for my, and these are fourth um, uh, operations of choice that you don't, you're not being required to go in. Your doctor's not saying you have to go do this. You're, it's not if you're in a car accident, you go to the hospital. Those things are not the things that are covered. But what I wanna mention is that um, this will be a big impact on employees. We are, uh, we met last week to start the plan to roll out the week of March 26th. We'll start educating employees. We will have um, sessions at every workplace in the town, um, DPW, every fire station, police station, every school, and we'll have multiple sessions at, at each of these places. We'll also have major meetings with uh, retirees uh, who will have be impacted by this as well to try and educate people about it. Um, a lot of changes, a lot of effort by staff, a lot of cooperation by the unions who have been educating their own members throughout this whole process. Um, and so I think that this sets us up going to, into the future as we will um, be going to Maya Blue Cross Blue Shield and then they have guaranteed that next year we will be increased no more than the midpoint of their range of increases. A lot of, of our members were concerned that yes, you give all your business to Blue Cross and then they jack you up the next year. That's not, a, they won't be able to do that. Um, so that, by that, by this change, we will reduce our health insurance price, but we still are responsible for any deficit that we incur this year. Plus, since we're self-insured, we have the run out for the medical expenses we incur during May and June that we will have to pay during July and August that surcharge um, will be incurred by both the town and by the employees, and that will be placed on the employees, um, and I can make a more thorough presentation, I didn't bring the chart with me, um, but the employees will know exactly how much it's gonna hit, hit them, and then that will be accounted for separately, and once the, that, those deficits and that, that run out is accounted for, then the surcharge will go away. We are budgeting that on a two-year schedule, so it's not too impactful on, on any one and any employees as, as because we're spreading it out over time. Um, our sense is that with year year one, we know where we, we are. Year two, we know it won't go up much more than the, it won't go up more than the midpoint. Year three, that surcharge will drop off, and then there'll be some flexible. So it won't the, the, any increase in year three shouldn't be as uh, impactful. Um, but there's no guarantees. My feeling is that this is about as good as a, as you can get in terms of looking into the future with health insurance these days. So happy with this. I see this as a, as a step. I see this as um, a good um, attempt to, to address our health insurance thing, our health insurance problem, and it also moves, moves the risk from the town, this is the most important thing, to the insurance company. So right now we bear all the risk and we've, we've paid for it because we've had uh, at least a half a dozen very large claims up to $250,000 that we've had to pay and that just decimates our, our self-insurance pool. That will then be moved to, um, to the, to the um, Maya Blue Cross plan. So big project, a lot of people put a lot of effort into it. Uh, Case Logar especially has, has put enormous amounts of time and the Insurance Advisory Committee, uh, led by Patrick Brock, was um, just struggled with it because it's hard to go back to your employee, to your union members, and say, "Guess what? We're asking you to raise your your rates, and you're going to have to pay a deductible." But they understood this, the predicament we were in, and they knew that if we did nothing, we would be making cuts of our budgets in the town, the school and the regional school districts of hundreds of thousands of dollars, nearly a million dollars in each of them, which would have requ required us to lay off people. And I think they recognized that was the unfortunate choice we were stuck in. So that's moving forward. The, um, what else? Um, oh, uh, we are about to be meeting with um, representatives from the town of Hadley for the ambulance. That's going to happen this week, I hope. Um, I anticipate and um, to talk about what the services we're providing, where they, where we are on pricing, and where they want, where they think we should be. Right now, they tr they pay us one hundred and forty thousand dollars for to provide the service. Uh, they account for about nine hundred of our five thousand calls a year. 
um, as you recall, they made, they went out to bid and they received one bid that was chart that charged the town two hundred and ninety two thousand dollars or something like that um, for to provide a service that had an ambulance stationed in the town of Hadley. Um, we provide high, very high level of, of uh, ambulance protection for the town of Hadley, and I think um, we'll be talking to them about how much, what they value, how they value things, and how we value things. So, I'll keep you posted on that conversation. Uh, aren't we're we're meet, meeting with the um, town administrator, uh, a member of the select board, and uh, the fire chief there. The um, and then just a couple other smaller things. One is um, the um, had a cup of had one of my cup of joes at, at Kelly's restaurant. Ms. Kruger was there. Pretty good turnout uh, with uh, the police chief, um, who seems to know pretty much everybody. <laughs> and um, and so it was it was really that's always a good venue because people come in and they have their lists of things they want to bring up about mostly about which roads needed attention for the most part and. We anticipated that, but um, but it was really good, really positive energy, um, really good connections on lots of different levels. Um, it was very positive. Um, I also gave my speech at the Mass Continu Continu Continuing Legal Education um, Seminar for Municipal Attorneys, um, and that went really well. And that was also a, a webinar, so it got broadcast out. Some people weren't able to make it because of snow, but they were able to watch it on on the, on the internet. And then today I made a presentation, sort of the town hall road show um, with the, at the Amherst Women's Club. And they had a really good turnout, you know, 40 people probably there. And that was a good session as well. Um, so I think that's pretty much all I have for tonight. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just one thing going way back to probably the first item, which is the snow and ice budget. Yes. Um, of course, there is a special set. There's a section of the uh, state law that um, allows the town some additional latitude mm -hmm. for snow and ice emergencies, such as this year in accounting procedures. So, uh, just to remind our colleagues that um, the, there is a more flexibility than just the reserve fund as far as how this can be handled. Correct. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Yes. Um, in your packet, uh, and you got this in the email too, there is a letter from the Amherst Pelham Regional School District um, that says that at their meeting on March 12th, they voted to authorize borrowing a sum to support the projects that were included in the Amherst Pelham Regional Capital Plan and discuss at the four towns meeting. And apparently this is, I'm not sure, I don't think this is, um, I think this is new. Like, typically, this has not been done. It has the minutes of their meeting, and uh, their auditors wanted them to present this to the select board and then to have the select board uh, acknowledge that you've received it. So they want to make sure that every every all four towns had received this notification. Um, so that's why this is in your packet. If, if memory serves, are required to notify us of it because yes. it compels us. We have an option to take exception with it. Correct within 60 days, so that's part of why it's here, and if we have a reason to take exception, we have a certain amount of time in order to sort of raise the issue as it were. Ms. Brewer. So I believe that it should be added to our agenda for Friday. Okay. okay. As, an agenda, as a list of topics item, because otherwise the public doesn't know that this is in our, it was in our packet, but it's not listed on our list of topics for today. And we got it as mail today, and so I thought a new version of it had come in, because why would it be in mail and both in our packet? But it got sent to us both ways. Um, but again, the public doesn't see our mail. So. Be, you got it in mail because it came in as a hard copy today, and they just copied ah, it and sent it out. Right. And I thought, ooh, maybe it's been updated. But no, it hadn't changed. And then, meaning that then on Monday we would authorize you to fill out this receipt saying we're done with it because the notice to the public part of it is that we have 60 days for the purpose of expressing disapproval of the amount of debt authorized by the district committee, which I don't believe we'd have any intention of doing, but I, that's why I believe it should be on our list of topics so we can so we say. we have the option to do that. We, it's like a first refusal sort of thing. Right. Like, mm -hmm. nope, we're not going to exercise our right to do that unless somebody's going to come in and tell us why we should exercise our right, right to do that. Okay. So do I, I believe it requires ultimately town meeting action if we're yes. going to. 
we'd actually have to have a town meeting yes Yes. which makes it even more appealing (laughs) to to actually do that but i mean if the public doesn't know that we have this option then so we'll make sure that that gets onto the agenda for Mm -hmm. for friday um so are there any questions or comments from the manager relative to his report to us um if not then we'll move into select board member reports do people have anything to offer relative to that mr steinberg uh yes um i'm going to report on one thing in particular um i have not been able to attend a lot of my committee meetings that i normally attend it and uh as you know, I've been uh, dealing with health issues, and I appreciate everybody's patience and um, assistance, but and it is all getting better. Um, actually, there are two. One is just to remind you the Kanagasaki um, visitors are coming this week, uh, weather permitting. I don't know what the, uh, how this is now going to affect the um, plan, but um, they, the, it is scheduled for their arrival on Wednesday and it is a traditional opening ceremony here in this room. But the other item I was going to talk about is a much more significant issue. You'll notice on the um, list of town meeting warrant item topics was to uh, a motion to repeal the zero energy and then replace the zero energy bylaw. And, um, is a reminder of what happened in the fall special town meeting. Um, the um, proponents of the article uh, made their motion. Um, the select board uh, made a motion to refer back to the select board so that we'd have an opportunity to um, have some type of process working with the proponents of the article to. Um, come in with a uh, version uh, that would be achieving the goals but also achieve them in a uh, practical manner that would allow us to move forward and actually assure that we could build the essential buildings that needed to be built. And um, I, we have been working with um, the group that had been the proponents um, and uh, we've had a series of many many meetings that have been very good that um, I've been attending with um, Ms. Kruger, Mr. Bachelman and the chair of the um, fire station um, DPW study committee in Grismore and um, you know, it, it, it is an ongoing process, but we have been working very effectively together and um, we'll be reporting um, at subsequent meetings um, and uh, um, on how that is going. But I just did want to report that a lot of work has gone on and I also want to recognize that we've had a number of members of the town staff who have been also extremely helpful in um, assisting us to think this through so that we can um, achieve the dual goals of um, building the kinds of buildings that were envisioned that um, uh, achieve or come close to achieving zero energy and but also make sure that we get the essential buildings that this town needs actually built. Thank you. Other reports? Ms. Kruger? I'll just so we can go in order that way. Um, you know, we're getting into that sort of busy spring season. So um, downtown parking working group met last week. We're, we're moving along. We um, <coughs> are going to be coming to the select board with some recommendations. Soon we worked on our timeline. Um, JCPC Joint Capital Planning Committee met last week and this week probably has its last meeting um, and wrapping up and that's been a, as usual very productive um, an interesting process. Um, and I saw on the um, 
town meeting warrant four week thing. Some of those are the capital items. Um, and Saturday, uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, myself and senior planner um, Nate Malloy did a presentation on municipal parking at the Citizen Planner and Training Collaborative Annual Conference at um, Holy Cross College in Worcester. And amazingly, the, the room was full. They, they run concurrent sessions, so there were four or five things that happened. You choose, but uh, lo and behold, a lot of people chose to come in and learn about or hear about parking. Uh, we were supposed to be doing it with Melrose, but so, there was some glitch, and so Amherst had the whole hour and a half uh, to talk about what we're doing. And like so many things, you know, you start trying something and immediately you're at a conference describing what you've done and you don't even know if it's <laughs> the thing. <laughs> like you're instant like expert, so we talked about that. But it was, it was really good and um, I enjoyed doing that um, with Mr. Malloy. We, it's a version of what we did at MMA, but we had more time and uh, I think uh, just people seem very appreciative and receptive. And then um, I'm going to let Ms. Brewer talk about this morning. Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid if I list too many things now, I'm going to get teased for not having a life. <laughs> <laughs> edit my list. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So moving on, Ms. Brewer, did you want to take up on your key? Sure. Here? So we had a, a flyer in our select board packet from February 26th that you all might remember because it was so colorful from Campus Community Coalition, which, of course, Ms. Steinberg and Ms. Mr. Steinberg and Ms. Kruger, and I'm very tired, um, are part of the normal campus community coalition, which we named long before the Cannabis Control Commission came along and stole our CCC acronym. And they ran a Retailers and Municipal Leaders Forum today, and a featured panelists included Pete Wilson, who used to work for Senator Rosenberg and now works for an, another agency at the state level, but had been a chair and well, had been a member of the Treasurer's Alcohol Task Force and therefore then a chair of a working group of that task force. And um, so those task force, the task force did its work basically over the past year and a half. The working groups did their work over basically a four to six week period in the fall. And then a final report was issued at the end of December. And this is what happened to the report. Thunk. <laughs> Shocker. I know you're all just so amazed that that happened with a state level report. But a lot of people put a lot of effort into it. And it doesn't mean that some of those recommendations won't get looked at at some point. But um, that report is sitting on the website. In fact, Campus Community Coalition is going to link it on their website so more people can go look at it. It's over 200 pages with the appendices. But um, Nobody, the treasurer's, it's in the treasurer's office lap. We all heard about how the treasurer was having financial problems and was looking at looking at um, additional funding from the state. And so this is probably not a priority to change things at this point, although some of the recommendations were in fact finding ways to more effectively deploy resources. So um, anyway, that task force happened. And because people, various people affiliated with Camps Community Coalition, including Spiffy, which Heather Warner was on one of the then working groups that was that was under the task force. And so was I, although we weren't on the same one. And so was one of the partners in the Campus and Community Coalition, who's a retailer. And so was an, a local town meeting member. And so we did have some Western Mass representation thanks to Senator Rosenberg and Pete Wilson. We actually had quite a few people affiliated with that whole project. So the panelists, again, were Pete Wilson, and then also Ted Mahoney from the ABCC came out, which is quite rare that somebody from the ABCC is willing to come out, and all the way to Western Massachusetts to help educate us about things going on. The new executive director of the Massachusetts Package Store Association was there. Uh, Chief Livingstone was there. Chief, whose name I know, but I've just now forgotten, from Hadley was Mason. there. Um, like whoosh, went right out of my head, um, was on the panel, was moderated by David Sullivan, our district attorney. 
And we also, in fact, at the end had a section from some students who are working on looking at alcohol policies, as I believe Ms. Kruger's probably mentioned before. And they are comparing and contrasting and basically making a big matrix of what Western Massachusetts communities are doing associated with alcohol policies. And Ms. Kruger's planning to talk to them more. I'm planning to talk to them more. Um, as we know, our, our project's kind of on hold associated with policies right now just because of all the changes that we're all facing. But it was an interesting thing, and we're going to have a follow-up on Wednesday at the Campus and Community Coalition to see what, but I, when I, I did basically, you know, when you chase somebody down into the elevator as they're trying to leave, <laughs> I did chase down Peter Wilson, and, he's, and he did indicate that the treasurer's office has not yet taken action or advised the working group that they're planning to take action at any given point, and since None of the people in the working group work for the treasurer. It's not like you know it's going to be on their agenda next week at work. So we will let you know if more comes out of that. But it was it was a great way to get retailers back in the room. We had retailers that we had from here in Amherst and from um, from the local area, and uh, to to you know sort of restart that conversation about how we can work together in partnership. And I think Chief Livingstone made it quite clear that we have really good partnerships with our retail outlets, whether they be restaurants or package stores. Here in Amherst, so that was that was a proud moment for us that we felt good that things were going well, and that is more than enough talking from me. Mr. Wall, do you have any? Just uh, briefly, but not briefly, as more pre uh, previews. Uh, the Cultural District Steering Committee has kept trying to have a afternoon-long retreat, but got snowed out twice. So <laughs> <laughs> we think that may happen one day, but I'm not going to put any money on that. And then the Historical Commission has been working very hard to revise the demolition delay bylaw, but that'll come to you as a warrant article, so I'm just giving you a heads up that that's moving ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of things. Number one, uh, PVTA, given the snowstorms and whatnot, extended the period for comment. Uh, so if people had additional comments relative to changes in fares and to service, you actually had until today to get that in. Um, unfortunately, I didn't extend it. It was originally the deadline was the 14th, but they extended to the uh, till today. Um, the other thing, uh, we were scheduled to meet on the 28th of this month um, with our normally scheduled meeting, and then we were going to have another meeting on the, let's say, the 11th as a special meeting of the of the advisory board for PVTA to actually take action relative to uh, what we heard in comment and and the. Um, uh, processing of that information into a, a, a coherent and specific set of recommendations to the advisory board relative to fares and service changes. Um, however, uh, there's also a statewide legislative uh, and regional transit meeting that has been snowed out at least once, mm -hmm. if not twice. So it has been rescheduled for the 28th. Um, I've been going back and forth in my own mind about whether to attend that or not and whether that would have much impact or not. Um, and certainly take advice from any of you all as far as whether that would be uh, advisable. And, and um, certainly uh, uh, I, the, the primary folks at, uh, you know, the director and some of the other staff of, of uh, PVTA will definitely go to that. Um, but they're encouraging advisory board members to go as well. Um, so I may do that next week. Um, I believe I have to let them know really soon. Um, <clears throat> so we won't have our normally scheduled meeting on the 28th where we would have had a sort of first broad brushstroke uh, bit of information relative to our, our, uh, the public hearings that took place. Um, so we'll get that in a little more compressed version. Um, I do serve on the Finance and Audit Committee, um, or subcommittee, I should say. We are diligently planning meetings in advance of the April 11th, so we'll probably see those recommendations that are going to go to the full advisory board at that time, um, and I'll advise you all as soon as possible relative to what actual changes are, are coming forward for PVTA. Um, the other topic I wanted to bring up was we had discussed potentially having a retreat this spring and potentially in April, mm -hmm. and so I'm hoping people have their calendars or some sense of their availability um, to meet in April. Um, and so I'm presuming we were. We know the 21st is out because Ms. Kruger told us right. that before. Are you out on the 20? You are out on the 21st. I would.
personally, I'd lean a little bit towards the 28th because I think that just gives us more time for all sorts of things. And the afternoon is, was also the other thing you were suggesting is a little later in the day as far as. Right. I mean, I had this um, idea if people want to, and we usually do in the morning, but if we to do afternoon, maybe take a little break and then maybe have, um, you know, a meal together. Right. And so I wanted a date because I wanted to think about how to make those arrangements and I might want to. <coughs> Um, so plan for that. Is the 28th too late versus, say, the 14th? Because the 7th is going to sneak up on us really quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 28th, the 14th is not. 28th is two days before town meeting starts. But well, it's kind of all done then. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, 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 Pie is baked, what are we doing on as the they say. I, mean, unless we could, I think the 28th, unless we could go as early as the 7th, and then we'll I have a conflict on the seventh. Yeah, then I think the twenty eighth, because fourteenth is getting ready to go away. So. Okay. Twenty eighth. What time are we going to say? Twenty eighth is the leading candidate. Mm hmm. Yeah. One one thirty. One. What do you think? Anything you want? Is one thirty? An okay start time? Or one, whatever. I mean, kind of like getting an idea, like, and we'd go till maybe four, and then four thirty, and then dinner would be like six. Come on, people, help me out here. Two might be a little too late, so maybe one or one thirty. We can just hold it also, then worry about the Yeah, people. we can. Just block it for one to five, and we'll refine it. We don't have an agenda right. for it or anything. Right. Okay. I'm doing it here. So we're okay so with one okay. o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. Yeah. So I think that will do. I, I, um, I'll talk to you more individually about the other part of the plan. That's okay. So, um, I don't believe I have any other member report information at this point that I'm recalling right at the moment. Does anyone else have anything? You moving? knew I'd think of more things to talk yeah, about. Right. Um, were you planning, Mr. Bachelman, to share? It's a loaded question. I thought you were planning to share <laughs> the GTI host community agreement with yes, you. Yes, I made it. I said that to myself. Oh, I forgot to email okay. it to everybody. Yeah. That, that, really but that cool. is the intention. I mean, and it's a public document, it right? It's not like right. it's a. Yep super secret sure. contract or something. Okay, great, so that'll be helpful. And then were we, were you able to talk to the health center about a possible tour before our Kanagasaki reception? Because when he said Kanagasaki reception, I remembered, oh right, we talked about trying to put those back to back um, to have that, our select our, board tour. They're, they're flexible, um, but uh, we had talked about today, but then we realized the empty bowls fundraiser that right. many people intended. So we couldn't do anything right before so board today. So if you'd like to do before Kanagasaki, which would be like at three, it's a, a, probably four o'clock. We have reception. a meeting. We have a meeting during that time. We have a four o'clock. Yeah, we just realized that. I think when we had, when we originally had this conversation, that wasn't true. I'm only gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do both things, so. So. The other option might be either before or after your Friday meeting. Hmm, that might be good if people can do that. Actually, that's not bad for me. If we'd only go an hour because, you know, we may have questions about the warrant, but you'll just have to take those from mm -hmm. us and mm -hmm. we won't, like, uh, fix things or resolve things. Would, Friday the 23rd for a tour? That, that would work for me. Is that okay for people? Okay. How I'll, long, see, I'll see if they're available. How long do, do you think our meeting will take? So. <laughs> I think it depends on how many questions <laughs> you guys like ask. Uh, well, since, since we're not talking a lot of substance about the Warren articles, because you're going to have that opportunity, I think an hour. What do you mean? We're not going to. We're not going to have the opportunity until the night we sign it. Right. Right. So I mean, I'm, I mean I'm if talking we want to fix terms of anything, what is the zoning bylaw changing in the planning board zoning? If you want to get into that level of detail, then we allow more time because we have department heads who could come in and talk to you about that. So if I could follow up on that, it had been my and because we should just share an understanding before we go in there. Yep. And I know you did mention that option, you know, then staff would be there. That's handy too. Is that 
we would not intend for staff to attend this. We are not going into it with the idea that people would explain, that other people would come and explain any of these articles to us. It's more just our first read of it, and just as Mr. Slaughter and Mr. Bachman have already done, associated with Warrant Review today, and then feedback they've gotten from KP Law before Friday to say, wow, this doesn't even make sense, or like, mm -hmm. what were we trying to do with this? And rather than that somebody's trying to come in and give us a mini presentation. We're not trying to do that. So in theory, I would have, I would think an hour or so we could do that. Does that make sense to people? Because that's about all the time we would normally spend on it at a meeting. Well, that, that's probably, I mean, there's, you know, like I said earlier, the, you know, the easements are rather fixed in their they just are structure. Easements. <laughs> Or easements and that sort of thing. Mr. Sunder, yeah. yes. Uh, the one thing yeah. that is significant yeah. uh, for your amount of time, potentially, because it is ultimately our article out of yeah. the process that I just described is the zero energy right. bylaw. That's true. Um, and uh, that may take a little bit more time for explanation than other articles. Because right. you haven't seen it yet. And right. You're not really going to see it. Till so one hour, on that. Already. <laughs> an hour on that. Plus an hour on everything else. Oh, so, okay, then so trying for 10.30. 10.30 for the tour, yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. And if they can, so if we can do that. Um, yeah. And, I'm going to be able to And there's there. a reason you haven't seen it yet is because once you see it, it's it's public and it's not finished enough to, to do that, which is partly why we're having a special meeting on Friday. Right. Yes. Excellent. So... And looking at my other reminders on my list here, and there is a reason I take these notes, is um, this, having been in this position before with people running for re-election and not knowing if they will get re-elected or not when they are not the only one on the mm -hmm. ballot, mm -hmm. I wanted to make a brief space for us to say nice things about our colleague, Mr. Slaughter, because I have been in a position of being on a committee where someone was just gone after the next me after the last meeting we had, and nobody talked about it before they left, and it was really, really weird. And so it's kind of weird to do it this way, too. But it's important, I think, that we, we none of us take enough time to appreciate our own service, and we appreciate Mr. Slaughter's service to us, not only as a colleague, but also as our chair for the past year. And the work on PBTA in particular, mm -hmm. I just, it, that has been a huge amount of work. In I mean, not that there's per se a normal year at PBTA, but still, this has been a huge amount of work in particular where you've had to go out of town for us and represent the community and then go to other hearings and represent the larger community as well and very specific parts of that community. So I really appreciate all the extra effort you've had to put in for that particular project in addition to all the other things you're doing with this, whether it's things like the warrant review, which I'm so happy I didn't have to do today, <laughs> and, um, and all the lovely chairing things we ask you to do and the follow-ups and the letters etc um, and getting back to people i think it's been it's been very i've been very happy to work with you so thank you for this i appreciate that thank you very much it's my pleasure to do that and to work with you all and it's been a, a, a real honor to serve with you all i'm hoping i get an opportunity to continue to do that um, but it has been a, a distinct pleasure to, to serve with you all and and i appreciate the the effort that you all put in on a day-by-day -day basis for our community and and uh you know i'm uh humbled by the amount of work that you folks do and and uh try to do my piece of that as well when i when i do my my work with with you all and and so um you know whether the public at large knows you know sort of what all goes on you know is uh is okay if they don't it's you know <laughs> nice if they do but at the same time it's uh, you know we don't do it for for uh for uh, people to call us up and thank us a bunch, but at the same time, it's it's uh, nice to sort of be appreciated. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ditto to everything Ms. Brewer said. Right. So unless someone has something else to add, I believe we've exhausted our agenda for the evening, and so I would be inclined. Next meeting is, is our Friday. next meeting is Friday morning at 9 a.m. Correct? Mm -hmm. Do we have a location? Um, I think the first, first, floor, floor. first floor and no public comment that is correct there will so be no public there will comment. be no public comment and then our next regular meetings the second right that is correct as well
And uh, because it's on the first floor, there will not be opportunity for live television on Amherst Media. Correct. That's correct. Yes. It will be a bit like watching paint dry, I believe, but <laughs> I wouldn't yeah, want to claim it will be that for sure, but it will be likely to be, be very On line four, what does so, that comma mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With that, I am going to make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we are adjourned at 9.13 p.m.